And uh, thank you, Governor Inslee. But um, my name is Eric Nelson. I'm the Executive Director CEO here at the National Nordic Museum, and it's a pleasure to welcome everyone back. It's been a long time since we've had an event like this. And again, this is our third in-person Innovation Summit and our uh, fourth in total. And it's nice to be able to gather again. And it's um, also incredibly nice to have some very significant VIPs here. Mr. President, welcome back. Mayor Harold, thank you so much for coming. Again, we were um, honored with the uh, privilege of having the governor with us last night. But um, all of my job is today is to thank you for coming, to thank our sponsors, and introduce the mayor of Seattle. Bruce Harold, please. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Eric. I deeply appreciate the introduction. I, I will, I'll start by saying I'm so excited that the president is here, like a little kid on the first day of school. I was one of those kids that liked the first day of school. I don't know. Uh, thank you for being here. And the very distinguished guests and council generals and uh, other elected officials, I want to recognize Councilmember Dan Strauss here. Uh, thank you for what should be an exciting summit as you are uh, in the middle of uh, discussing new ideas on climate change and um, not just climate change, but cyberspace security and aviation and equity and pay and all the exciting challenges that we have in front of us. I will tell you that um, I think, and I'll, I'll use Iceland as a great example, that when leaders so well versed in history, and I, I know your background because I, I know how to read Wikipedia, <laughs> so well versed in history, um, use history as, they don't use it to weaponize it, but they use it, I think, as a source to create the kind of future that we, we fall in love with. When we look at the challenges of Iceland, and I, I love coming here, by the way, because one of the things we're doing here in Seattle, and, and I won't take credit for it, I'll just uh, take credit for participating in a movement that even started before I became mayor is that, yes, we celebrate our, our differences. We celebrate our unique challenges that we have in cultures. But we celebrate it, I think, with the purpose of driving our thoughts and what we have in common. And so when I look at the history of Iceland, the history of, and I know, you're, again, you're so well versed in it, the history of, of its struggle throughout the centuries. Um, I know you've read extensively, you've written extensively on the history. But for me, it's, you know, I. I've done more than just watch the series, The Vikings, which I did watch, by the way. I, I tried to read as much as I could, not in preparation for this, but for me, particularly here in Ballard, looking at the Scandinavian um, history and how you preserve that which is so important, which is a rich, vibrant, exciting culture, it's just fun to do. And so hopefully in our leadership, when we talk about One Seattle, we embrace our good people here in Ballot and those who take so much pride in their roots, which is so exciting, always with the intent of building a greater city. So as you continue your summit, I do want to make a, um, a few statements about um, the sister city relationships. A lot of people don't know we do have sis two sister cities, um, uh, uh, one in Iceland, of course, and one in Norway, Bergen in, in, in Norway. And so these sister relationships, I think there's some people here affiliated with our sister, sister, sister city groups. These are very precious to us. We put a moratorium on the number of sister cities because we want them to be very special. And along those lines, uh, and I'm going to do something, I'm going to embarrass Councilmember Strauss, I'm going to ask you to come up uh, here for a minute because we want to make an announcement that we're really excited to do and certainly it's our pleasure to do it in front of President uh, Johannesson that uh, I think many of you know we've worked really hard to preserve the, this building and this culture and we are announcing a, is, uh, that we are announcing a $400,000, $400,000 which is what we call a non-competitive recovery emergency fund to be used for operational purposes here. I want to thank Councilmember Strauss. <laughs> Um, 
this four hundred thousand dollars is a uh, used. We we say emergency funds, but it's not as if we're panicking. But we recognize the times that we're in, where we're wearing masks, and the challenges. And I want to thank publicly our director of um, of arts and culture, Miss Royal Alley Barnes, who's right here. We stand up, Royal, please. <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Royal Alley Barnes, someone I think I've known for, geez, 30 or 40 years, worked tirelessly to make sure that uh, the application was reviewed and that uh, we would treasure this kind of investment. So in closing, I will say this is, we are, as the governor said so eloquently, when we're looking at alternative forms of power, when we're looking at innovation, we're looking at partnerships. I mean, he stated it so well that this community, and particularly in New York, your leadership, I mean, I could, Again, I, could, I would embarrass myself if I tried to talk about Iceland's history, but I do know you were one of the founding members in, of NATO, and I do know that um, the work, again, you've done over the decades and decades to make sure whether there were, what I'll say, negative foreign influences, make sure the independence and the, the values that made the Nordic culture so great in this world were preserved. So uh, these sister city relationships are near and dear because being a mayor, I have to say, it's always local. So when I'm sitting next to someone so great in the national, I say, oh, forget the president. I want to meet some mayors. <laughs> I want to meet the That's where the action is. Again, you've honored us with your presence. Thank you for being here. It's my honor to be part of this. And thank you very much for keeping such a gem. Isn't this place cool? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We are your co MCs uh, for the session this morning before Robert Strand will take over the baton this afternoon. We are. My name is Tola Rutila. My name is Berger Steen. And welcome. Welcome. So, this event has already become an institution in the four years we've been doing it. <clears throat> the first year, it coincided with the opening of this fantastic new museum. Um, and we wanted to start a platform for dialogue between countries on opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean, as well as between history and future here in, in Seattle, which has arguably the most vibrant tech community in the world, I think I can say as a proud Seattleite. Um, and since we started, that's, that's really been how we've grown. In 2019, uh, we, added our, we had our second conference, we added more speakers. In um, 2020, we uh, went all virtual. We were going to go hybrid, we saw a pandemic evo evolving, but then when lockdown happened, we went, went virtual. And we had record attendance, over 7,000 views um, by now for, for that whole session. And then we built a muscle that we developed further in 2021, what we call the Nordic Innovation Series, which is smaller events that come out through the year as more of a rolling thunder. So if you haven't caught those yet, we hope you stay tuned to the ones that are coming up and also check out the ones we've done. And this year, of course, we are doing a hybrid event again. So we have friends from all over the world watching us as we speak. And we'll, of course, be able to watch the event afterwards. And that also, the, the muscle we built last time has turned out to be very useful because we still have the pandemic going on. We had two guests who were supposed to speak and are not going to speak remotely. Um, but uh, the museum has built the ability or capability to, to make that happen, so that's great. And of course, this year, the title of the conference is Innovating for a Common Future. That was supposed to be a reference to the original Brundtland report that came out in 1988, and which, for practical purposes, defined the term sustainability as the it's, it's sort of core tenant of, of development work uh, and also of climate. Um, it became more relevant still since we formulated the title, because obviously the 24th of February, um, Russia invaded Ukraine, and innovating for a common future took on a little bit of a different flavor, which we'll also hear about more later in the program today. And really remind us how important this kind of dialogue is for the future of <clears throat> open democracies, frankly. So with that, Tula, I'll leave you to kick it off. Thank you, Birger. And on behalf of the local business community, I also want to welcome you all to Seattle, uh, to the National Nordic Museum, and to our summit here. 
and everybody in the room and online, and like Birger said, this is a new hybrid environment now. And I moved to Seattle eight years ago. I come from Finland originally, and uh, I moved with the Nokia acquisition to Microsoft and, and worked for Nokia for 15 years, and now I uh, found my new home here, my second home in Seattle and, and at Microsoft. And I think a you know, big part of it is the museum. And it is the community that we have here. I'm one of the board of uh, trustees. I think, uh, Birker, you're now an honorary Sorry, trustee. Yeah, and actually, we didn't practice this, but we have uh, several of our board members here. So why don't you all stand up and wave and, and welcome everybody to our wonderful museum. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great board, and, and I, I think our ambition here is to be more than a museum. And I think by now you've already noticed that this is more than a museum, and we want to reinvent the idea of what a museum means. And, and these uh, last uh, few years have really helped us with the digital transformation. So, so really, this is a, a, a meeting place for different uh, communities, our community in Ballard, of course. Uh, you know, we're, we're proud part, uh, members of the Ballard community, but also broadly with the Nordic countries and increasingly a global dialogue. So, so very proud of the museum and, and the work that we all do here. And uh, now it's my immense honor to welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Gudni Johannesson, the president of Iceland. And we're so happy that you're here with us today. And like we already heard from the mayor, uh, in addition to, to being the, in the office since, I think, 2016, you are also a historian. You have a PhD in history from uh, uh, Queen Mary University in London. And you are on a, on a US tour uh, meeting with tech companies and talking about the importance of, of language as a heritage of our culture and how important it is uh, you know, for the modern technology, AI, cognitive services in the cloud, to really perceive, uh, perceive, uh, preserve and, and strengthen that heritage. And you're such an important advocate for small languages like Icelandic or Finnish, and we're very grateful for that work, uh, what you're doing, and you're making you know, our AI better. So, so thank you for that work, and thank you for being here today. So with that, I want to invite you, Mr. President, to take the stage and, and talk to us about innovation, independence, and interdependence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, all, near and far. Mayor of Seattle, Iceland's Minister of Business and Culture, Excellencies, everyone. Rosala Kamana Vermeer. Great to be here with you. Uh, last night I had also the honor of attending a session here where brilliant companies uh, told us how they were going to move forward, uh, what their innovations were, and I mentioned then how great I felt that we're talking about the future, we're talking about innovation, new techniques in a museum where we look backwards on our history. And in the spirit of sustainability and recycling, I repeat these words. We sometimes also need to recycle our speeches. But I'm not going to bore you, though. I'm not going to tire you by repeating word for word what I said. And after all, I'm the president. I can say what I want. <laughs> and I'm a historian. And it is my passion to uh, emphasize that we need to learn from the past as we look forward to the future. So I'm going to talk about, yes, innovation, independence, and interdependence. And I want you to go with me on a journey. We can call it from the very beginnings to the present, if you like. But I'm going to give you examples of five innovations and how they have affected us and what we can learn from them to make this world a better place. They're practically random. There's hardly any connection between them, except though they all connect to Iceland somehow. You have to forgive me. I'm the president of the country. <laughs> so we're going to talk about long ships, the Viking ships. We're going to talk about vellum or calfskin. We're going to talk about Coast Guard wire cutters. 
and I can see heads rolling. What on earth is that? I'm going to talk about geothermal energy, and finally, the future of Icelandic in the digital age. So the long ships, they were built in Scandinavia uh, more than a thousand years ago, developed, so by the ninth centuries or so, the people there had developed these smart, fast sailing ships that could take you over the open ocean. So they traveled the Norse on these vessels, the long ships from Scandinavia, onwards to the Faroe Islands, to Iceland, and finally to this great continent in which we find ourselves now. Uh, we have celebrated these daring voyages, this trip into the unknown. So here in the US, on the 9th of October, every year, we celebrate Leif Eriksson Day. And I'm not being promoted here by the company to mention it. It's a coincidence. <laughs> it's Leif Eriksson Day on the 9th of October. Because Leif Eriksson, or Leif the Lucky, was one of those Norse men who sailed onwards from Greenland and discovering uh, land further east. 9th of October. Now, why 9th of October? Well, in 1825, the first group of immigrants from Norway arrived from Stavanger uh, on the uh, uh, eastern shores of the US. So that's the connection, Leif Eriksson, group of Norwegian immigrants. And ever since the uh, mid-1960s, we've celebrated Leif Eriksson Day. So on 9th of October, every year, the President of the United States issues a proclamation declaring this to be Leif Eriksson Day when we celebrate the voyages of the Norse over to what we now know as North America. All well and good. Well, not all well and good. In 1975, there was tension in the relationship between Iceland and the United States. Court war was brewing, and I'll come to that a bit later on, fishing disputes between Iceland and, and Britain. And on the 9th of October, the President of the US in 1975, uh, Gerald Ford, issued a proclamation on Leif Eriksson Day honoring the achievements of Leif Eriksson, the son of Norway. the son of Norway. The ambassador of Iceland in Washington, D.C. demanded a change, an apology. Leif Eriksson, or to be precise and correct, Leivur Eriksson was not a Norwegian. <laughs> he was an Icelander, and you need to correct this. And this was sensitive. This was difficult. Keep in mind a court war connection. We need to keep the Icelanders happy. So how do you solve this? We have diplomats in the room. Their job is to find solutions, find compromises, find ways out, reduce tension. So the next presidential proclamation on Leif Eriksson Day, and ever since, has contained these good words. And you can see the last one from President Biden last year. On Leif Eriksson Day, we celebrate the achievements of the Norse voyagers, and especially Leif Eriksson, a son of Iceland and grandson of Norway. <laughs> Talk about diplomatic smartness. Now, that's all well and good. But if we want to take a closer look at this history, we know for a fact that Leif Eriksson or Leiver Eriksson moved from Iceland to Greenland at the age of three. So if we want to issue Leif Eriksson with a passport, it might as well be a Greenlandic one. Furthermore, this is all good. These stories of daring voyages across uncharted waters, we could celebrate those, and we should celebrate those. But we need to avoid the temptation of claiming or celebrating that these good people from well over a 1,000 years ago discovered a new continent, as if it were a terra incognita, where nobody lived. I understand that we are now on land 
uh, that was inhabited or is inhabited by the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people. So we must avoid the old temptation, the old thinking that by honoring Leif Eriksson, we're honoring those who discovered this continent. No, we can celebrate these voyages, these daring voyages, but at the same time acknowledge that there were people here whom they actually met. Uh, well, it's easy. We can do both. We can always find the compromises. We don't even need the diplomats. Celebrate the achievement, acknowledge those who were here. And we could also mention a female voyager, Guðríður Thorbjarnardóttir, who also sailed uh, eastwards with this daring group of, of uh, people from the Nordic region. So we can celebrate the uh, skills and the bravery without belittling or denying the existence of those who were here before us. And we can always, as well, quote Oscar Wilde. Ah, yeah, the Vikings, smart people. They discovered America, but they were wise enough to keep quiet about it. <laughs> and the capability of making fun of yourself is an essential capability uh, in uh, the world as it is today. So I hope I'm forgiven to, uh, to mentioning this over here. Now, it connects also with independence and interdependence, because we want to be able to celebrate achievements of the past, but we must never be arrogant. We must never be uh, negative. And uh, the kind of nationalism we want to develop must be without uh, those uh, aspects. We need to celebrate diversity, plurality, and uh, uh, respect for others. So that were, those were the long ships. One innovation that connects in this manner with independence and independence, interdependence, and we remember the achievements of Leivr Eriksson, the son of Iceland and grandson of Norway. How do we know? What do we know? Why do we know these stories? Why do we know what happened? That moves us on to vellum or calfskin, because, yes, we have archaeological remains, especially at uh, Lanzo Meadows in uh, Newfoundland, demonstrating or proving that people from the Nordic region moved over to that part of the uh, world uh, around the year 1000. But we have the sagas, the Icelandic sagas, wonderful tales of voyages and, yes, battles and feuds, all kinds of slayings, but love as well, and uh, honor and bravery. And stories of kings, the kings of Norway, and all the parts of the Scandinavian region. Stories of the ancient faith, stories of Odin and Thor, Freya, Frigg, Loki. You come across these in the Avengers movies, and it's not Loki, it's Loki. And it's Ausgardur, not Asgard. <laughs> but we forgive you. Icelandic is difficult to pronounce. We have all these tales. And one of the giants in Icelandic literature is a man by the name of Snorri Sturluson, a chieftain in Iceland and a writer. He compiled, gathered stories of the heathen faith and the Norwegian kings, the Eddas, and we have the sagas as well, all the Icelandic sagas. Snorri. Uh, had in his domain the good place of Bessastadir, what is now the presidential residence uh, in Iceland. And in the uh, early and mid-13th century, there was a volcanic eruption nearby. And his livestock fell because of the volcanic ash and the fumes. And so he had loads of dead calves. And what do you do with the dead calves? You get the skin and you write these tales on it. So every cloud has a silver lining. There might be a volcanic eruption in Iceland now as we speak. Let us hope and pray that it will not be harmful if it happens to uh, lives and infrastructure. But in the 13th century, a side effect of a volcanic eruption was an immense uh, amount of calfskin. So we wrote the stories on the calfskin, kept them like that. These stories are not written in isolation. Yes, they are unique. Uh, they are Iceland's contribution to world civilization, along with uh, skir, the yogurt drink, and fermented shark. 
But these stories are unique, but they're also based on a common European heritage. So it's a perfect example of the combination of independent, independence and interdependence. Uh, what we need to be aware of as we applaud this national cultural heritage is to guard it against people who are willing to abuse it for their extremist purposes, who misinterpret the sagas and our cultural heritage as a demonstration of supremacy of one group of people over another. We need to defend Asgard against those extremists. And how do we do that? We do it by demonstrating and proving that the cultural heritage is not about that. It's not about supremacy of one group of people over another. No, far from that. Look at the gods in detail, and you'll find one of the gods enjoyed cross-dressing, for instance. And the stories emphasize honor and dignity, not violence, not hatred towards others. So uh, that's what I would like to emphasize uh, there. And furthermore, the Icelandic sagas and this cultural heritage emphasizes, yes, independence. That's one part of my theme, personal independence. And I connect it with the Nordic welfare model, where we want to make sure that every individual, however that person may be, can get a chance to thrive and prosper, to have a dream and work towards that dream, get the space needed for that. But also, if you need assistance, if you need help, we are there for you. You're not on your own. Try your best, do your best, make your dreams come true. But if you need assistance, we're there for you. That's the Nordic model in essence. Individual responsibility, individual freedom, collective duties. This is how we should work things. This is the message from the Nordic region to everyone who wants to hear us. And it's based partly on our common cultural heritage, the Nordic Icelandic cultural heritage. And then, when the time comes, we say goodbye to those who leave. We can also quote our wisdom from the Nordic sagas, from the sayings of the old gods. And then we say, cattle die, kindred die, everyone is mortal. But the good name never dies of one who has done well. This is what we can bring from the Nordic heritage to our contemporary world. So, long ships, calfskin, Coast Guard wire cutters. I felt it was like a continuation of our struggle for independence. This is what one of the uh, captains of the Icelandic Coast Guard vessels told me as I was working on my PhD dissertation about fishing disputes in the North Atlantic. And mind you, connecting the past with the present, our Coast Guard vessels are called Odin, Thor, Tyr, the War of God, and the latest one, Freya, the female goddess. Freya is the goddess of uh, love, I believe, among other things. But don't mess with Freya on the seas around Iceland. I felt it was like the continuation of the struggle for independence. We Icelanders, fortunately, know very little about wars. We don't have a military. We're proud members of NATO. And we look forward to welcoming our Nordic friends into NATO. But we're not experts on war. And sometimes that can be a blessing. We know a thing or two about court wars, however. So independence and Iceland. Iceland became a republic in 1944. Can Iceland survive on its own? That was a question that was asked then, even among our friends. You're too small, you're too tiny, you cannot survive there on your own. Yes, we can, and we did. But we needed to gain sovereignty over our natural resources around the island. We needed to get control of our fishing grounds. 
and that we did in a series of steps, expanding the fishery jurisdiction around Iceland, first from three nautical miles to four, four to 12, 12 to 50, 50 to 200. And we're there now for the time being. <laughs> now, these fishing grounds were popular with other fishing people, particularly from our friends in Britain. And they weren't that friendly at that time. They protested every move. They said, these are international waters. Freedom of the high seas must be recognized. You cannot do this. So when we moved to 12, 12 miles in 1958, the Royal Navy went up to Icelandic waters, protecting British fishing boats, the trawlers, trawlers like you can see in the good harbor of Seattle, protecting them from harassment from Thor and other Icelandic Coast Guard vessels. And we, we were a bit helpless then. There was very little we could do. Uh, my grandfather was, was one of those Coast Guard boats, and one of his friends would tell me, well, what could we do? We could just shout towards the trawlermen, towards the fishermen. And we said, and in Icelandic accent, you are fishing illegally, you must leave immediately. But the British trawlermen, rough as they were, but very kind people at heart, they would just say, bugger off. <laughs> and that was it. We were a bit helpless. However, we managed to gain victory there. Uh, the British had to back down. But then we moved outwards again in 1972. Later this year, we'll celebrate the fact that a half a century has passed since we moved the fishing limits to 50 miles in 1972. And again, the British protested. And again, they sent the Royal Navy to protect the British fishing vessels, the trawlers. But now, we could do more than shout, you are fishing illegally, leave immediately. No, now we could use our secret weapon. Trawling is a business whereby you drop the net, you drop the trawl, and then you haul it in. So here you have a trawl, and you here you have the sea. And imagine fish in this sea. Imagine Icelandic fish in this sea. And the trawler is somewhere here, and here's the, here's the trawl wire. So the, you get the trawl into the trawler, and you get the trawl full of Icelandic fish into a British trawler, and that we do not like. What's the answer? The answer is the wire cutter. So. Instead of the trawl being hauled into the trawler, you have a Coast Guard vessel sailing like this, cutting the wires. So down goes the trawl with our good Icelandic fish, and you have furious trawlermen on that boat, but very happy Icelandic Coast Guard skippers. This changed completely the dynamics of the situation. Instead of them catching fish and sailing onwards to Britain, we were able to do this on a multitude of occasions. And the British frigates, the British warships up there, tried to intervene, but they were not built for that. They were built for a completely different kind of warfare in the middle of the Cold War. So this secret weapon, the secret wire cutters, completely changed the dynamics of the situation. And ultimately, after a dispute over 200 miles, led to full Icelandic victory. Hooray. And this is Iceland's contribution to modern warfare. <laughs> but again, it's not you know, completely an Icelandic invention. It's based on, funnily enough, uh, you know, British uh, uh, mine, uh, mine sweeping uh, gadgets from the Second World War. But the idea is, to use it in this manner is, is Icelandic. As we tell this story, we need to again acknowledge the bravery of the Icelandic Coast Guard captains and their crews who managed to do this. But if we want to explain why we, Iceland had achieved victory in these court wars, we cannot only look at that. We cannot only look at the actions of the, 
of the Coast Guard skippers because the law of the sea was floating and developing in Iceland's favor. The nations of the world were also moving in this direction. So well before Iceland moved to 200 miles, many countries in uh, Latin America had taken that step. So we were also benefiting from that. And furthermore, this was in the 1970s, these later disputes, in the midst of the Cold War. And Cold War and Cod War were intertwined. The British protested, the British sent warships to Iceland, and the message from Washington, are you nuts? Iceland is a proud NATO member. There's a very important naval base, military base at Keflavik, Iceland. And they are saying, unless the Brits back down, we're closing down the base. So priorities are here. Put strategic security above fishing interests. So that was also our weapon. The wire cutters and the presence of a military base uh, in, the, uh, in Iceland. Now, I encourage you to come to Iceland, look at the wire cutters, and see how we managed to beat the British. Uh, I would not have amended my speech even if, I, if the ambassador of Britain would have been here. We're all friends now. But this is a story of David versus Goliath as well. And we had, it's, a, it's ingrained in our mindset, our Icelanders, to celebrate these victories. So, yes, come to Iceland and enjoy the uh, stories of court wars and uh, the Icelandic sagas, but also come to enjoy the swimming pools and the hot tubs and see firsthand how we use geothermal energy, the fourth innovation I'm going to mention. I mentioned Snorri Sturluson, the chieftain and the writer who wrote and composed and compiled and gathered tales of gods and Vikings and so on and so forth. He lived at a place called Reykholt, Smoky Hill, because it's, there's an abundance of geothermal energy there, hot water coming out of the uh, underground. And he had a hot tub there, probably one of the very first hot tubs in Iceland in the mid and early 13th century. So he would sit there and think as he enjoyed the warmth of the water, like, what should I write about next? Just like we do today. Alas, he was slayed there by a band of villains. Uh, and we Icelanders all know his famous last words. Eie skal hökva. Thou shall not strike. And then he died. I'll come to that again in a moment, but uh, uh, first I want to focus on geothermal and innovation. We don't only use geothermal energy for soaking in swimming pools and hot tubs. In Iceland, we use geothermal uh, resources to heat practically all our homes. It is the cleanest energy you can wish for. It's the cleanest way to heat your homes. And Yes, I readily admit that. We need to heat our homes, especially in wintertime. Furthermore, we can use geothermal energy to produce energy, clean energy. Now, it's not our innovation, of course. Others have done it before us. But in Iceland, we have a mass of knowledge, a mass of people who know a lot about how you can use geothermal energy. So this is an innovation that is more forward-looking, perhaps, than long ships and calfskin and, hope, as well, wire cutters. And this is something I encourage you to have a close look at. The development and use of geothermal energy in Iceland necessary journey towards a world full of clean energy and uh, where we manage to uh, combat climate change and reduce CO2 emissions. Yeah, furthermore, we know how to drill CO2 into the into, yeah, underground. It's one amazing achievement as well. Now, finally, as we move on towards the end of my speech, the digital age and the future of the Icelandic language. We're on a mission here. 
It's an honor to be at the Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, but we're also here for a different purpose. My team, my Minister of Business and Culture, experts and specialists, we're on a mission. We come in peace. Icelandic is a thriving language. It's a strong language. I'm not worried about its future. I'm optimistic. We want to speak Icelandic, the people who live in Iceland, including my wife, Eliza, who was here a couple of weeks ago, born and raised in Canada, moved to Iceland, and she said to me, I'm not going to stand here and live here and keep asking, what was she saying? What is he saying? I'm going to learn this language, even though it sounds and looks silly at times. <laughs> and even though I make mistakes, as she said. And we want to foster that and encourage that for all those who want to move to Iceland and be a part of society. And then we need to help people. And we need to make technology an asset in that. Yes, it's a thriving language. We publish more books, I think, per capita, at least, than almost any other nation. And we love per capita statistics. <laughs> We're a small nation, yes. I think we have more per capita statistics than any other nation. <laughs> per capita. We have the longest river in Europe. Per capita. <laughs> but we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard. Icelandic is strong. It's thriving. We love it. We write poetry. We write crime novels, as many of you may know. And just let me reassure you that way more crimes are committed in books and on pages than in reality. Iceland is one of the safest countries in the world. And we have many statistics to prove that. And we don't even need per capita there. <laughs> but we have to be on guard. Remember what Snorri said? Eigi skal högva, thou shalt not strike. I was telling this story to a group of kids whom I took up to Reykholt, to Smoky Hill. And I said to them, and here, Snorri was lying in his hot tub, and then he went in, and this group of bandits came, and they slayed him, and they said, Eigi skal högva. And he said, Eigi skal högva. But they still struck, and he died. End of story. And as we were driving back from Reykholt, back from Smoky Hill, I said to this group of kids, now, do you remember what I was talking about, about Snorri and how he, how he ended his life and his famous last words? And then there was one of them who said, oh, yes, yes, yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember well what he said. He said, please, ekki högva mig. Please, don't strike me. English crept in. Snorri did not say please. <laughs> and now we have this challenge. The next generation our lovely kids who are going to make this world a much better place for us. They play computer games and they love it. They're on YouTube, they're on the internet. And they say to each other when they're playing, Þú þarft að dodja. Þú þarft að substituta. Ég bara chilla. You need to dodge. You need to substitute the player, get a new better player on your game. I'm just chilling. And when I hear them say this, I become a bit boring. And I say, I don't understand you. A totcha. I've never heard that word in Icelandic. Oh, you're saying, I need to see cover. Yet harva leita skjóls. And they were like, that. <laughs> this is an issue we need to tackle. Yes, we want to be cosmopolitan. We need to learn other languages. All well and good. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we can still maintain the fact that from generation and gener to generation, Icelandic continues to be understood because we can understand texts written from thousands of years ago. But if we are not careful, Icelandic will uh, suffer from the influx of the wonderful English language. So there's job to be done there. Furthermore, English uh, creeps in in other ways. And don't get me wrong, I'm, it's not a negative, uh, it's just work to be done. Uh, hey Siri, uh -huh. do you speak Icelandic? Hmm, I don't have an answer for that. Is there 
something else I can help with? Siri and her friends, Alexa, and all that group of wonderful people who help us in our daily lives, they do not understand Icelandic. Our mission here is to make sure that soon we will work together to teach Siri, Alexa, and others for the benefit of ourselves, but others as well. No language should be left behind. Universal speech translator, that's the message from Meta. And other big companies agree. And we do not come back in here. We have meetings with people from these uh, companies. And we tell them, we're in a win-win situation, if you take a close look at it. We in Iceland went on a campaign. It's not often that you ask people, talk for as long as you want. Speak as much as you can. Say anything you want. But this is what we did in Iceland. We want to record you. So we, we amassed a great data bank of Icelandic. And we can bring this to the table for these big companies and tell them, here's our stuff. We just need to make sure that you can put this into your uh, hardware and software, and we will both benefit from that. So I'm very optimistic that this is work to be done that will be achieved, and we will be able to talk to our phones uh, in the not too distant future. And also we can, actually. We're just on a road there. Hi, no, no, all right. Hold on one second. Hi, Embla. Do you speak Icelandic? Hi, Embla. Talar thu Islensku? Hi, Embla. Don't fail me now. <laughs> she needs. Hi, Embla. Talar thu Islensku? Takk, Embla. I love you. <laughs> Embla is there. The technique is there. The task is achievable. We just need to get going. So, as I conclude my speech, we have moved from long ships to the digital age. We're always innovating, and we will continue to innovate. And we will continue to be proud Icelanders, proud Norwegians, proud Danes, proud Swedes, proud Finns, proud Greenlanders, proud Faroe Islanders, proud Sami, proud entities who have their own culture, own language, own past. But at the same time, we want to keep this cultural heritage in a positive manner and also be global citizens and use history to foster friendship and plurality, diversity, not hatred, bigotry, or fear or hatred towards the other. This is our task, especially at times like this, when we see aggressors claiming territories in the name of nationalism, in the name of history that is abused. We do not want that. And let our cultures thrive, and then all shall be well. But we have to be on guard. As I said, when it comes to technology, when it comes to the evils of nationalism, when it comes to the need to stand together and defend the good cause, and I conclude by moving back to literature and culture and poetry, because we Icelanders love our poetry. And we can translate it to others. The finishing lines of a poem by Thomas Guðmundsson have captured me since I read them first as a child. They're beautiful in Icelandic. And I hope I manage to capture their essence as I translate them into English for you. But the time will come when I will be able to say it in Icelandic for you, good folks, 
and you will hear it in wonderful English, even better than uh, my version, my improvised version now. But these finishing lines go like this. For when there is wrong that you can put right, and when there is struggle that you stand aside, the troubles of this world are also your fault. Tak fyrir, thank you very much. Do I have sound here? Yeah. So Arul and Nico, um, if you wouldn't mind joining us on stage, we'll also get you mic'd up. Um, there you are, Nico, please. Why don't you take a seat here, Arul, and Nico over here. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, so we have the, the good fortune and luxury here to, to be joined by um, by two quite unique individuals uh, in this particular area uh, on which the president ended his keynote. Um, so Arul, to my right, is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft. And um, I actually just learned before we started, around about the time I came here for the first time, was, um, was working on uh, Microsoft's internet efforts. We might even have met in the corridor somewhere there uh, around the Netscape IPO. Um, but also you have created Microsoft Translator, hmm. which uh, is a product that does support Icelandic. Yeah. Although our own, and I'll take it to task for this later, not Sami, <laughs> which is another Nordic language, actually spoken across multiple Nordic countries and in that oh, quite that? unique. Yeah. Um, Nico, uh, you've also been at Microsoft, if I'm correct. I have worked at Microsoft, yeah. yes, so I, I know the enemy. And then you, <laughs> yes, exactly. And then you jumped ship and you went and created uh, the other uh, speech god, not Siri, but, but uh, Alexa. That's right. Um, so we have, we have really, we have two of the people who are responsible both for what has happened and accountable for what could happen in this area with us. So I want to start with you, though, Mr. President, because uh, you've been on a tour, mm -hmm. and you met, in fact, just a little reflection on this. We have, we have developed technology that can target human preference and human emotional and cognitive life so precisely that we're able to lock ourselves into echo chambers that are so narrow we can fool ourselves into, for instance, attacking um, the most sacred buildings and institutions in our own democracy. But we have not managed to do the same thing for languages for some reason. Mm. So, and I know you just met with Meta. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a riddle hidden in there. Um, and I hope to hear more about that from Arul and Nico, but what's been the results or the commitments or the, you know, the, so far from your trip up and down the coast to yeah. To work on this. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear what I'm saying. Very well. Uh, yeah, the results have been positive, and uh, uh, I very much look forward to uh, meeting the representatives of Microsoft uh, later today. And I'm convinced that uh, there will be the same friendly uh, reception there as elsewhere. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, with social media comes social responsibility and the gigantic developments in technology we have witnessed in the uh, last few years and decades ever increasing ever faster pose these challenges you mention and we are here just to focus on the uh, on the uh, uh, language aspect and the voice recognition and the speech recognition aspect of it. So I'll focus on that also as I, as I reply. It's not only because we want to make sure that a language, a small language exists, it's also a human right as it were. We have an island up there in the North Atlantic 
where people are not necessarily fluent in English, where people may have uh, disabilities, visual impairment or other disabilities. And if we cherish and promote technologies that rely on voice command, we must make sure that this positive development for the vast majority of people doesn't leave some people out. So there's that aspect to it as well. Uh, so uh, it is not only for some cultural or historical reasons that we're on this mission. It is because we want to live in a society where nobody is left behind. And technology must be the force for good in that sense. Because if not, then we should just go back. Then we should just throw out all these positive developments that can be so useful. But there's always work to be done. Uh, I'm told with all the experts that yes, it's possible, it's Icelandic. I've met one person though who told me that speech recognition, voice recognition, all well and good, except with Danish. It doesn't work with Danish. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. It's a very, yeah, we won't go there, but it's, nobody understands Danish except the Danish. But that's my take on this. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I think I'll go to you first, Nico, uh, because it, my experience from the software industry is uh, when you do product roadmaps, um, New Zealand, it's another beautiful island, I think pretty much uh, antipodium to, to Iceland, uh, exactly yeah. on the side of the earth. And it's quite popular with, with early trials and pilots because it's, it's isolated, so what goes wrong in New Zealand stays in New Zealand. <laughs> and it's English language, so what you do there, you can do straight off your, your, your beta or even mm -hmm. earlier versions. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought the president made a super case with this, uh, all the data that they already have uh, captured there. So do you think Iceland could be a, a similar thing but for the process of localization, per, you know, precisely and then for long tail languages? I, I think the data is, is very important. And it, so Iceland has had uh, a lot of foresight here uh, in, in collecting data and in working with the industry. Actually, the, uh, the text-to-speech, that's the output of Alexa uh, that we use now. It, we, we, uh, there was a company that joined us that, that was called Ivona. Early on, they, they joined us. And even before that, Iceland had worked with them uh, actively to, to get them to produce uh, Icelandic text-to-speech. Um, so so that, and by collecting data for them to work with, and I believe giving a grant so that they could, they could do that, they, they produced two Icelandic voices. Um, and, and that was a great company. They joined uh, Alexa a few years in our journey, and then and now it's the voice of Alexa as well. Uh, and that voice is available on AWS uh, Poly, a service too. Um, when uh, when when we think about uh, languages in Alexa, first of all, we want everyone to be able to use Alexa. That's our goal, right? So uh, we, uh, we want our teams to be ready, and when they're ready, we will launch uh, in new countries. Uh, the, there's one thing, though, um, when I'm sitting here with someone from Microsoft. So when I was a, a graduate student in the 90s, Microsoft was already working on speech technologies. Right? At Amazon, when I joined 11 years ago, we had to start from scratch. And we had to build this new thing as well, the, the, this uh, speaker that you can talk to from a distance. And it was a completely new type of speech technology. So I have to admit, the first few years, uh, we just struggled to make that thing work. Like the engineers had this joke. They, they could only test one thing. They could say, play music by Sting. That was the only thing that worked. <laughs> you must have grown tired of Sting by then. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of Sting being played in the office. Uh, so. Uh, but then, uh, over time, we've, we've started to scale this out to more and more language, and we did this in the traditional way. We scaled by taking the language, one language at a time, collecting the data, and so on. Um, and now we have 17 languages. 
after 11 years, so, uh, um, and, and it's accelerating. For the, when you get into the tail, though, to get the next million users for Alexa, it's much more work, right? So, uh, what, uh, we're, what we're working on now is uh, new type of AI and machine learning technologies where you can, you can, one language can learn from another language. It's called transfer learning or, or uh, multitask la learning, uh, which accelerates the speech technology a lot. So my hope is that uh, sometime in the near future, it's not going to be the language technologies that are, are the bottleneck for launching in a new country. There's launch, any company launching a product in a new country, there's, there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but my hope is that the, the bottleneck is not going to be the speech technology for us. Great. So, Arul, um, the next question was actually going to be to you. Should we be optimists? And I think this is a perfect serve for that response. So should we, be, should we be optimistic? Should we think that this is solvable and, and soon to be solved problem? Yes, I think so. Uh, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm so excited to be here uh, at the Nordic Museum because at the, uh, when we launched Icelandic, I believe was the inauguration of this museum yeah, and the president was here in right. 2018 and it all came together uh, at that time and we were very uh, thrilled to be able to support Icelandic uh, as I think our 62nd language at the time. We're now about 111 languages in Microsoft Translator. And in the right place if you might say so ourselves. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, 111 sounds like a lot, but there are more than 7,000 mm. languages that have been enumerated uh, in the world. Probably, you know, nobody has an exact count. And I think as the president so eloquently uh, spoke about in his uh, speech, uh, you know, language is the vehicle for culture and um, a society. And when a language dies, uh, you know, an entire culture goes with it. And, there are a lot of threats facing languages today. Um, uh, probably languages are going extinct faster than, um, than, um, than species. And it's, it's a matter of grave concern. And at Microsoft we have um, an initiative called uh, AI for Cultural Heritage. Of course, the challenges of language uh, pre uh, preservation are much broader than technology. But what our goal is what we can do within uh, within the technological world, within AI to help. And you mentioned, uh, your, your question was about uh, what are our grounds for optimism. So uh, Nico referred to this, but one of the most exciting um, developments, I think, in recent years in uh, neural technology is that we can now build these massive uh, pre-trained models, as we call them, that um, uh, span hundreds or even thousands of languages and you train them all together and some languages may have billions or even trillions of words of data available and others may only have a million words or a hundred thousand words or even less and because you train these these languages together uh, through the magic of transfer learning uh, they all become better uh, because uh, the a uh, tremendous amount of data that you have for say an English or a French or a German helps you learn the structure, helps the model learn the structure of the smaller languages. Um, at Microsoft, in, so I'm part of the Microsoft AI platform in Azure, uh, and uh, one of our efforts is uh, a model that goes even beyond multilingual and it's also multimodal. So we're training uh, speech and language and uh, vision together, and what we find is that uh, just as training across languages makes the model stronger across all of these languages, training across modalities also makes it stronger. Uh, so we just released um, the first part of that, uh, something we call Project Z Code in March, uh, where we were able to jointly train this massive pre-trained model for uh, 100 plus languages uh, and it made the quality of translation, especially in the smaller languages, just dramatically better than we could do if we train each of them individually. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think there's grounds for optimism. That's of course the technology. Uh, in order to make the technology work for people, we are constantly working with 
communities because our data, we want to work with communities to get the data that they have prepared or uh, work with them to elicit data. Uh, so recently, uh, just as an example, we worked with the Inu uh, Inuit community and the government of Canada to ship Inuk to Tut. We work with the Maori community and the government of New Zealand uh, to ship Maori. We, uh, we recently shipped Faroese in cooperation oh, nice. with the community oh, there. Um, uh, so we're, we're, you mentioned Sami, we're working on Sami. Right. We don't yet have a partner, actually. We would appreciate um, being connected to, um, uh, I know there's no Sami speakers in Iceland, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I was part of the effort to yeah. get a Sami supported in an office, but that's yeah. 20 years ago now, so I'm not sure they're still there. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so we, we love working with, I mean, we worked with universities to ship, for example, indigenous languages in Mexico, Mayan and mm -hmm. uh, Otomi, and, um, uh, you know, so, so we love working on these partnerships because a big part of it is working with the community, getting the data, and making sure the technology uh, works for the community and what, they, what their needs are. So um, these models that you train, they're typically data hungry. So Very, more, yes. more data, better, better yes. uh, outcomes, right? Yes. So precedence in the, the Icelandic strategy, should it be to try to federate somehow, you know, with, with more of you, like work with perhaps two or three platforms, or should they work only with you, or only with you? Are you I'm not going to comment on that over <laughs> no, here. No, no, this is, this is for these gentlemen. <laughs> well, I, so, think, I think they've been uh, following the right strategy of collecting yeah. a lot of open source data that's available right, yes. to everyone. So it's, it's available to the, academic, it. yeah. to the academic community, right. to any company, and you know, mm -hmm. then it just makes the language stronger. You're yeah, I want to emphasize that, Pinker, that uh, yeah. the, the stuff sorry. we've got, it's, it's it, yeah. we, we work on the assumption that uh, anyone who wants to use this for their benefit and ours is right. free to do so. I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Seems like we but have, let me just add yeah. that another uh, uh, development in, in the machine learning and AI is uh, trying to get the same result with less data. So there's a lot of emphasis on that right now uh, for several reasons. Uh, you know, smaller languages might be one, but also privacy. So uh, there, used to, there used to be less constraints on privacy and, and it was easier to get large volumes of data to be able to train these models. Uh, but now that we understand you know, the, the privacy concerns of our customers, uh, we will, we're going to have to work with less. And so that, so, that so helps. Alexa no longer listens to me in my kitchen, is that how it's working or not? Uh, I, I will not answer. I will not justify <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. that question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm uh, curious. But, but that's, uh, so there's, there's many positive developments in AI and machine learning, uh, and that, that field is moving so fast right now. So, so I'm, I'm very optimistic on you know, mm -hmm. getting, getting it done with less data and also being able to use multiple languages uh, Languages have a lot in common, right? And yeah. we, haven't, we haven't used that before. We, we train one language at a time. Uh, but we, when you train models that are, and you mentioned that too, right? You train your, your translation models with large numbers of languages together. Mm. They, they benefit from each other a lot. It is an amazing development that should make the global village a better place. I was in right. Hungary. Uh, at the start of this year, attending a sports tournament, and I wanted to know what the good people of Hungary were saying about the matches being played, and I just put it into translation, and I got what I thought and assumed was a fairly accurate uh, translation. But then I'm always reminded of um, pos possible pitfalls. I have the honor of uh, convening parliament in Iceland uh, by a speech, and the finishing line is always the same. You be think man, at minnast ættjarðarinnar og rísa úr sætum. I ask all members of parliament to remember the motherland and to rise from their seats. And they stand up. My wife Eliza put this into translation because she wanted to know what I said. And in English it came out like this. 90% correct. Isn't that a fair ratio? I ask all members of parliament to remember the motherland and resign. <laughs> <laughs> Rise from their seats, resign. You're up, you're up. 
I'm sure there are presidents in this world, not me included, who want that, would want that. But it's a word of warning there. Well, you, I noticed you, you, you didn't say remember. which translation, and I'm happy. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it wasn't yours. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you might remember, this is actually kind of a dark joke by now, but when, the, when, when um, Secretary of State Clinton traveled to Moscow, she brought a reset button, but uh, the, the Russian translation was overload. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, there we it's are. It's dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. Um, so I, I wanted to also sort of bridge to one of the later discussions we're going to have today. So you, you described how you innovated your way out of the Cod Wars. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit about later about how we can <clears throat> do new things different and different things in what looks like it unfortunately might evolve into a, a Cold War number two um, over the next few years. Regardless of what happens in, <clears throat> in the Ukraine, it's unlikely that um, the West and, and, and Russia will be very friendly, on very friendly terms very soon. So, so we're going to explore that a little bit. Um, and language is probably going to be an important part of that too. If you think about all the smaller languages that are lining the border, if you think of Estonian or Sami or uh, multiple, yeah, Icelandic for that matter, you're, you're a border nation. So uh, is, there a, is there a defense aspect to, to, to this mission you're on as well? There's certainly a political um, aspect to language and language policy when you look at the uh, conflict in U Ukraine, when you look at the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, where the uh, uh, argument among the leadership in Moscow is that, well, Ukrainian isn't really a language. Come think of it. So uh, <clears throat> language has this political dimension as well. Uh, let the people of Ukraine decide whether Ukrainian is a language or not, and you will get a different answer. So in this, as, uh, this uh, field, uh, s strengthening a language is also a uh, political uh, argument, as it were. But at the same time, I want to emphasize that language should not be exclusive. Iceland has changed tremendously in the last few decades. When I was growing up, we had a very exotic kid in my age group in, at school. His mom came from Sweden. <laughs> that was the difference, different from us. Today, thousands of citizens in Iceland have foreign origins, either moved to Iceland or their parents moved to Iceland. And they're not as good in Icelandic. It goes without saying, as those who can trace their ancestry to Leifur Eriksson or Guðríður Thorbjarnardóttir. And we must make sure that language does not become yet another barrier for those who have moved to Iceland and want to contribute to society. And that's also where technique is going to help us. That's where technique is going to make it easier for others to communicate, to learn. So uh, language policy always has a political dimension. And as in this example, it can help us preserve unity even yes. with increasing diversity. We had a weather reporter once who hailed from abroad saying the, well, the weather news in Iceland are important. The weather changes by the minute. If you are land in Iceland and the weather is glorious, enjoy the day because it's not going to be like that tomorrow. <coughs> this weather reporter uh, spoke with an accent and there were people who complained. I find it hard. He's not like the other weather reporters. I'm used to the others. Can we get back the old weather reporter? Not somebody with an accent, please. But we could completely understand every sentence he said, every weather prediction. Rain is coming, wind becomes stronger. <laughs> Possibility of sunshine, very slight. <laughs> he replied in a brilliant manner. He said in Icelandic, yes, with an accent, but everybody could understand. He said, Þeir skilja 
sem vilja. Those who want to understand will understand. And that's the ethos, that's the spirit, and then the technique will help us. Thank you so much, Nico Arul, Mr. President. Thank you. Fascinating discussion. You have important business to attend to, so I think we need <laughs> yeah. to wrap it up there. But yeah. thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So, you're headed off. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I actually... No, I know. We're busy. But I met with the team yesterday. Yes. And we have a plan of working forward. And I know. I'm very happy we're going to be up here with our director. I feel safe to say here, without the mic, Microsoft preparation has been outstanding. Good so, um, very short introduction to our next panel because Tula is going to take it from here. But uh, we are super proud and excited to have two entrepreneurs who are both putting modern technology to work in dealing with and eliminating uh, gender pay gaps, gender differences that shouldn't be there. Uh, Tula, please take it away. Thank you, thank you, Birger. And uh, so let's uh, switch uh, gears. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation about Icelandic language and culture and, and the opportunity of technology. So, uh, you know, such a great dialogue. And we're, we're continuing uh, with another theme, but equally important and, uh, and interesting. And uh, we have quite a catchy, you know, title to our talk here this morning. We are talking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the Nordic paradox. And you know, it's a commonly known fact that the Nordic countries are very advanced in their kind of gender uh, equality. Uh, practices and policies, and certainly when I moved here to the United States from Finland, I, I realized what a privilege we have with our longer maternity leaves, uh, you know, with our universal childcare policies like that, that really support the gender equality. And then at the same time, there's research saying that, you know, these uh, more progressive policies in the Nordics have actually created a more segregated uh, workforce, which I, I find very interesting and paradoxical. And I guess, like with everything else, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And uh, what we are here today to explore is uh, data. What does data say about you know, what is the, the, uh, the truth and reality, and how can we use data to solve the most important issues that we could do when it comes to equality and, and diversity. So with that, I would really like to turn it over to my uh, esteemed panelists and would la like to ask you, uh, Margaret and, and uh, Marie, to introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, you uh, should go first. I will start. So my name is Margaret Bjarnadóttir. Uh, I have a PhD in what's called Operation Research. Nobody knows what Operation Research is, but it's literally how we can use data and models to support better decision making. So I'm an associate professor of management science and statistics at the University of Maryland, and I'm also the founder of Pay Analytics, which is helping organizations close their demographic pay gaps. Awesome. Well, my name is Marie. Um, I'm uh, actually a, a medical doctor by profession. Uh, I'm, I trained as a surgeon for many years. I have a PhD within colorectal surgery, which is absolutely not relevant uh, <laughs> to what we're talking about. Um, but I've also always been very passionate about diversity and inclusion and, and women's rights uh, in, in uh, particular. So I've been doing a lot of work on the side there. And I was invited, because of that work, I was invited to the UN back in 2014 when they launched their uh, biggest gender equality campaign. Uh, where Emma Watson gave a speech that has been uh, going down in the history books as sort of the, the beginning of the fourth feminist wave. 
And she, she said a lot of things that um, was, uh, I was very inspired by, and, and uh, one of them was, if not now, when, if not me, then who? And this was back in 2014. Uh, gender equality and diversity was not on the agenda then, uh, not uh, in the US, not, not, not in the Nordics. Um, and as a young uh, female surgeon in a very, very male-dominated field, I felt that gender equality was definitely not something that we had achieved. So long story short, I wanted to address that. I started a campaign uh, in uh, the Nordics to address unconscious gender bias, which went pretty well. Uh, and I can talk more about that later. But uh, uh, as a result, I saw a huge opportunity. I saw that we need to work with this very differently than we do today. Um, and I started a call to check, uh, which is a tech company uh, where we do uh, some of the same things, uh, but we're using data to identify where the problems are uh, in companies, where they can benefit more from being more diverse, and then we add more evidence-based solutions to, uh, to uh, improve. Thank you, and great to have you both here today. So then let's go in a little deeper, and if you think about the, this uh, landscape of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Nordics and globally, what have you seen and observed in the past few years? And maybe we start with Margaret. Sure, I think one of the biggest changes that we are seeing in DEI is we are going away from just thinking about, you know, equality in terms of binary gender. So not only are we moving, you know, and we're already talking about diverse definitions of gender, but we are also moving towards thinking more broadly about other dimensions of demographics that impact everything, right? So this one thing that we actually do better, so I spent half my time in the US and half the time in Iceland, and one of the things that we are more comfortable talking about in the US actually compared to the Nordics is race and ethnicity. So um, when we think about what is happening with the European legislation right now is that it's really focused on gender. I was really happy to see that we managed to broaden out a little bit the definition of gender in the EU, new uh, EU Transparency um, Act. But I think in the, what's happening over in the Nordics, and now I'm putting a little bit my pay equity hat on, is that the businesses are almost ahead of the legislation. So when we work with organizations and they close the gender pay gap, they don't just say put a, you know, um, a, a wrap it up and say we're done. They immediately start thinking about, okay, which other dimensions of my workforce should I be thinking about? So I think the change in terms of this broader DNI agenda is really, at, at least in, over in Europe and the Nordic, is coming from the business community more than the legislative process. And uh, we can learn, I think, a couple of things from the US on just how we think about these things uh, there, because we're not as comfortable talking about it. That's interesting. And I would say, you know, having worked here in the US now for the past eight years, the, the, you know, the private sector is a force here as, as well. Marie. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that I, I echo what you say. And then I think another distinguished uh, difference now compared to just two years ago is that diversity and inclusion has been seen sort of as a niche that you do because it's a nice thing to do, nice thing to do but it doesn't really, it's not a core business core in any way. Uh, and, and there's been a huge change there just the two couple of two years uh, where we now see that companies are starting to see that this is not only a competitive advantage, it's going to be, uh, it's a competitive necessity to succeed in the future and, and that's why uh, the companies and, and, and business community now is pushing this on the agenda and, and we see that uh, just a few years ago, diversity and inclusion was something that companies wanted to talk about, uh, but it was a lot of talk and, and no one really did anything and we didn't really see any results. Um, according to McKinsey, uh, which is, this is a statistics that's a couple of years old, but according to them, only 24% of the companies that implement measures see effect, which is a really, really poor success rate. If I, had, as a surgeon, had that success rate, you know, <laughs> my patients would be wouldn't be very happy. Uh, but it, it's uh, statistics that we've been sort of happy with when it comes to diversity and inclusion, because it's something that people wanted to talk about and they didn't really see why they had to see results. And now that is changing. So now companies, they need to see results. And I think that's why we see companies like us, like you uh, uh, thriving because to see results you need data you need to, mi to make the right diagnosis you need
So I think that's, uh, that's another positive thing that means it's, it's a good time for us to be in this field right now. And then an another thing which I think is interesting in terms of the, the differences between uh, Europe and, and US when it comes to the broader diversity span and the regulations is that it's definitely becoming up, sailing up as, a, as an important trend. Uh, in Europe we have a bit of a different story and history when it comes to this compared to the US. We had, uh, we were, many of, of our countries were occupied by the, by the Nazi German uh, Reich. Um, and so, and that's one of the discussions that's going now in, in, in Norway, for example, when the, it, it was actually the Norwegian, the lists that the Norwegian police had with who were Jews and who were not Jews, those were the lists that the police used to deport Jews to, to the Germany. So uh, that's one of the major reasons that many, many Nordic uh, um, governments are very, very afraid of, of storing that kind of data because mm, it has privacy. been misused yeah. Uh, yeah. previously in, in, in very bad ways. So, but that's, uh, that's another way uh, why it's good for companies like us because we can sort of um, help bypass that, that uh, yeah. and we can help broadening the, the diversity spectrum without um, having to uh, store that kind of data for the companies. So you already started with the positive, Marie. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what do we think that the rest of the world uh, can learn from the Nordics? Like what are we doing well in this uh, space? I'm happy to go. Okay, yeah. let's. Yeah. Well, I think because I think one of the things that you said about the Nordic paradox, it's interesting, uh, and and what the Nordic paradox says is that because of the measures, we actually have a more gender segregated uh, workplace, which is a uh, uh, that 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 is not necessarily true. And I think we're touching there upon one of the things that happens very often within diversity and inclusion is that we confuse correlation with uh, causality. Mm. Uh, so uh, what the measures that we have in, in the Nordics have uh, facilitated is to get women into the workforce. So we have a very, very high percentage of women working in the, in, in the Nordics, uh, whereas in other countries, very often when you have kids, uh, women have to stay at home. Um, so uh, I think having those kind of measures, allowing everyone to have the same opportunities, that is definitely the right way to go in terms of getting more equality. But then even in the Nordics, we have some structural differences uh, for cultural and historic reasons, which means that people are not treated or seen the same way. And those structural differences is what we have to tackle. So um, the measures that we have, uh, I think it's, it's very speculative to say that they are actually causing the gender segregation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I can expand a little bit, because I, <laughs> so I was asked to be on this panel, and when I saw the title, I started by Googling what is the DEI <laughs> paradox, so, <laughs> so no, but now I know. But in my mind, it isn't that much of a paradox. So if, for those of you who didn't Google the topic of the panel, <laughs> the, the DEI paradox is just, is the fact that we, in the Nordics, we are ranked on top on all these equality measures, but still we are lacking female representation in the top, right, in business. So in my mind, and then there's the paradox, right? So uh, in my mind, it isn't that much of a paradox, but more a signal that we are not there yet. Right, so we are on a journey and we might be, you know, leading the way, you know, when it comes to equality. Um, it just means that there's still glass ceilings that we need to break through um, and we are working on it. Yes. Um, and then um, in terms of, you know, what, because your original question was, okay, what can the rest of the world learn from us? So if I put on my academic hat, I've been taking part in a lot of panels on women in tech. Right? And women in tech in the US, because I'm a professor here in the US, and just the reality that faces young women in America in tech is very different from what the reality that they're facing in the Nordics. So the conversations that we are having in the US, those are conversations we would have been having in the 80s in the Nordics. They are expressing concerns that there isn't daycare, that they can't afford to keep their job and have children. And thankfully, in the Nordics, we have moved past this, right? So I think number one, two, and three, that's something we need to make this a more, if we think about, you know, what can the US learn? We need to make this society more women friendly and mm -hmm. family friendly and support women in having an access to be active participants in the workforce. And, and I think and following that also uh, seeing that having children is not just the mother's burden. 
because I think that's another thing that we're starting to, to become better at in the Nordics, uh, that the, the fathers also have parental leave. The fathers also sometimes have to go early because they have to pick up in kindergarten. So this is not something that's only uh, limiting women, it's something that limits parents uh, and something that should be facilitated for everyone. So that they, there isn't actually a burden uh, to be a mother uh, more than, than being a father. Yeah. I sometimes, sorry, and then yeah, I keep, keep going. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes when I'm having these conversations in the US, I sometimes switch the conversation around and say, instead of talking about you know, sharing the burden, let's talk about the right of the fathers to be in their children's okay. lives. And then we are having a very different conversation. So maybe that's the conversation that we need to be having is that you know, the fathers have the rights to be involved in raising their children. And my learning has been that when you make the society or workplace better for women by creating some of these systems of equality, maybe understanding in your current system what causes inequality and then how do you break that and build a more systematic way to, uh, let's say, gender uh, equality, equal pay, or, or you know, supporting any diverse group, it makes the culture and the society better for everybody. So, you know, it's this intersectionality that when one group wins, actually everybody wins. And I think that's where you also, uh, you come back to why is uh, this time different? Uh, because companies, so the business community, see that this is a competitive necessity. Why do they see that? Because the war for talent is now coming up in, in all countries. And talent today, uh, what they look for in a workplace is they look for an inclusive culture. They look yeah. for uh, a work-life balance that's, uh, that's working. Uh, fathers today, at least in the Nordics, they want to be included in their children's yeah. lives. So, so this is also a part of the, uh, of the competitive uh, edge around uh, diversity and inclusion, which is actually driving uh, the change in the companies. Absolutely. It's no longer nice to have, but it's like a basic requirement for a company to succeed. So then uh, you both are wonderful entrepreneurs. So now I would like to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your companies. And really, you know, Birger and I already went there. There's reason to be optimistic. So, so, you know, how can your companies help drive positive change? And either one can, can start. Sure, I can. Company. So my company is called Pay Analytics and we are really focused on pay equity and helping organizations uh, close their demographic pay gaps. So what we have built is a cloud platform that enables companies to measure their pay gaps. And here I think it's so important to think about there's not just one pay gap, there are pay gaps along all the different demographic dimensions, right? And we also need to think about there is pay gaps across the organization and then within each groups of um, of employees. So what we have built is a robust approach that is both effective uh, and fair to close all of these different pay gaps and we are seeing great results. So our initial development partner drove down their pay gap to 0% in a matter of months after struggling to reach that goal for years. Um, we work with organizations as large as 140,000 employees that looked at their data and drove down their pay gaps to less than 1% across 50 subsidiaries in uh, nine months. So we are seeing uh, great results. So what we do at the core is that we help you measure your pay gaps. We identify who needs a raise and how large those raises need to be. And then we also help you integrate pay equity into all of your compensation processes so that these gaps don't come creeping back. Because every organization is a you know, thriving organism and there are changes. So every decision that you make also impacts your pay equity. So you need to integrate pay equity into your um, processes. So, uh, so that's the core of what we do. Thank you. Marie? Super impressive. So we do uh, uh, s s s partly in the same field. Uh, we're a Norwegian-based uh, uh, startup. Uh, and uh, like I said uh, initially a little bit, what, what we see, which is great, is that companies, they want to change, they need to change. Uh, their problem is that they don't know how to do it and they don't know uh, why they have the problems they have uh, and they don't have the correct data to, to uh, correct it, like you said initially in, uh, in your uh, introduction. So 
what we do uh, is that we've sort of applied the medical way of thinking around this. When I uh, came into the field, I was very surprised to see that there was a very uh, a huge lack of evidence-driven approach, huge lack of data-driven approach, uh, and, and very, very poor results in companies. Um, so what we do is that we help companies identify, understand, and act on their diversity and inclusion problems or opportunities. Uh, we collect three different data sets. Uh, we collect structural data, which is partly pay, uh, partly advancement, partly seniority, etc., parental leave, uh, and then we collect demographic data uh, on the broad diversity scale, uh, because like you said, uh, in the Nordics and in Europe, it's harder for companies to collect demographic data because of GDPR, because of the culture, because of the history. As a, a third uh, party, we can collect that, collect that data on behalf of the companies. Um, and then we collect cultural data, which is how you uh, thrive, uh, if you feel included, if you're thinking about quitting. Um, and then we get huge data sets uh, and, and based on that we can make a very very uh, specific diagnosis on, on where the problem in the organization is, uh, what's the lowest hanging fruit, uh, where will you see most effect if you improve, and then we pair it with evidence-based solutions so that companies know what the problem is, why they have it, and, and what they should do to improve. And, and we do this in, in a tech uh, 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 architecture and then uh, help uh, companies improve. And we are based now in Norway. Uh, we have, uh, we started selling our product last year. We have uh, more than 50 uh, companies in Norway that are uh, clients, many of them very large, uh, both Nordic and international companies. And we are spending the next few months just to making sure everything works, and then we're uh, looking to scale abroad as well. Fantastic. I would like to make it a little bit more interactive. So we have a little bit of time also if there are questions in the room. So if anybody you know, has a question uh, they would like to address to our esteemed panelists, uh, now would be a great time. And maybe I'll ask uh, one more question if uh, you know, anybody wants to think about their question. And this really, you know, for you to kind of go to the next level with your companies, what would you need? <laughs> So uh, I can go first. Yeah, and so uh, yeah, I can tell you where we are at. So we're at 100 clients. We are in 40 countries, every continent except Antarctica. Um, so what do we need? Uh, more marketing and sales. Mm. <laughs> and that's what we are working on. Uh, so we are, we are backed by Eirir, um, and we are basically scaling up our sales and marketing um, across the world. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, it's, as a startup, we always need a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> right now, we're fundraising uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, optimize our product. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, the most I think exciting thing about being in this space right now is that there's a huge opportunity span. Uh, because this is, I, I think this is going to be the, an, the next sort of mega global mega trend. We've seen it with climate, etc. Um, and so one of the exciting things now is also to understand what do the companies, what problems do they have? Uh, what problems do they actually have? What problems do they feel that they have? Uh, how do you solve them? And how do you do that in a way that's scalable? So that's one of the other things that we spend a lot of time on now is to understanding that. Uh, and so that's one of the things we, we, we need, I think, as, a, as a, um, all startups working, the, working within this field is to see how can you do this in a way that's super effective, that's super easy, uh, and that gives a lot of uh, outcome for the, for the clients to make sure that this is actually something that is going to be done in companies uh, and to see that we can, in the future, uh, we can assure that there are equal workplaces for everyone on a very commercial <laughs> journey getting there. <laughs> Did we get any questions from the room? Yes, okay, here we have, uh, we have a microphone, uh, body, uh, we have a microphone uh, phone coming to you. Thank you to all of you on the panel. This is super interesting. Uh, I'm from Denmark. I lived in the United States for over 30 years by now. And in the time I've been here, I've found that within large companies, there's a lot of secrecy around pay and compensation, and a lot of um, there are a lot of individual considerations for what you're paid, how you're paid, why you're paid, what you are, and even. In some cases, you can be terminated for sharing your salary or your compensations with others. So this is a super important topic and initiative. And I'm curious what the reception of, um, of these um, initiatives, and, and especially uh, for you, Dr. Bonadartia, um, being in the US, what have you seen from the US, from US companies, employers, in terms of their willingness to 
to uh, implement um, you know, initiatives like what you have and if there's an appetite for even starting to talk about pay equity? It's a great question. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, no, I think uh, there's great appetite. So I would almost split this in two. So there's a lot of legislative change happening and then there's a lot of things happening within the corporate world. So for example, as an example of the legislative change that is happening in the US, it's all happening at the state level. Um, and for example, in Massachusetts now, um, they have a new legislation, well, it's probably two or three years old by now, that actually allows organizations to measure their gap. And if they act on it and fix it, it they can't be sued on to, based on that evidence. So what is holding pay equity back in the US is that if you measure a pay gap, and let's say it's 6% or 8% or 4%, and that the word got out, well, you have a legal case coming your way. And that is really hindering uh, organization being able to look at their data proactively, fix issues, etc. So the way things are set up now is that um, typically, there's a legal counsel in the middle. Um, so that's the traditional setup, but I think it's changing fast. So one example is that Massachusetts is trying to take that away so that you can actually look at your data and fix things, so to accelerate change. Um, and then, you know, Colorado, etc. there's a lot of change happening that will, is trying to push this, including, so you mentioned that you're not allowed to talk about your salary and you can be terminated. Um, there's numerous, the last time I counted, I think that is forbidden now in 23 states. Uh, but there's one state that I'm not going to mention that has forbidden this to be forbidden. Um, <laughs> but so, but there's, I would say there's a lot of action happening to try to move this forward. And then the second part of your question was about the appetite. I think it's increasing. So we have a lot of US customers. So we, we can split up our US customers, A, into legal firms that are using our solution for their clients. But then we have a number of clients that are just actively using our product to make sure that they are paying fairly. So. Um, it's on the uptick. Um, there's some progress to be made, but I'm optimistic, and I think, just like Marie was saying, that um, if you're not able to your employees to explain how you're addressing pay equity, you're falling behind. Anything you would like to add, Marie? No, I think that was a very spot on. <laughs> so we have another question, and I think I'm conscious of time, but maybe we can do one more question. So we, I think we had here a hand in the, in the back who was first, so. Oh, this, is that Christina? Yeah, okay. It's hard to recognize in the mask, but that is Christina, okay. Thank you so much. Um, super interesting panel. Thank you for being here and sharing all your um, wisdom with us. Um, I'm really curious, who are you, um, approaching when you're doing your sales? Who is, are there CEOs or HR or corporate counsel who come to you to help them solve this issue and this challenge? And then secondly, what sizes of companies are you talking to and who are actually taking this on, you know, fully? I'm happy to start. Yes, uh, thank so you. I, it's a very good question, and what that question is, in essence, is how how mature are the companies we sell to? And I we sell to all the uh, the people that you talked about, depending on how mature companies are. And in very mature companies, uh, they see diversity and inclusion as a competitive edge, uh, and they want to improve uh, to improve their performance. And in those companies, we often talk to the management uh, and to the CEO. In the companies that are a little little less mature, uh, it's sometimes more about being. Uh, risk uh, to avoid risks like reputational risk or financial risk uh, and then in the least mature companies it's more about being compliant with the legislation so uh, in the most uh, mature companies we talk with uh, with the um, uh, the CEO or the the more strategic uh, uh, management in slightly less uh, mature companies we talk with HR and in the least mature we talk with uh, with uh, those that work with compliance and then we sell them in there and then we use uh, we, we, we help them sort of push them up in the maturity uh, uh, ladder. And we sell, to, I think it's not, uh, we're, we're asked a lot what, what kind of uh, clients do you have? Uh, and it's, uh, it's hard to, 
uh, to say a specific uh, kind of, of, uh, of clients because it's, it's, so, it's so broad. So we, s we sell to companies with 50 employees and companies with uh, 10,000 employees just in Norway and, and, and in companies that are large international companies as well. So I think it's more about um, industry. It's, uh, it's uh, mostly within the business community and especially uh, within the uh, business community where talent, attracting talent is, is very important. Um, and we've seen also that being uh, sort of uh, widened uh, just the past uh, couple of years. So branch uh, industries that were very immature two years ago uh, are now uh, very eager clients of us because they see that, whoa, we, we really missed out on this trend. We didn't understand that it was going to be this big. Uh, and now we desperately need help to, uh, to uh, get back in the game. Yeah, just to answer the same. So typically we are selling to the heads of HR and comp, um, sometimes to the chief finance officer, um, less to the legal departments. They are more, or the internal counsel, they are more kind of taking in to uh, approve the contracts. And then in terms of clients anywhere, I think our smallest client has 83 employees and our largest has over 140,000 employees. I saw so many hands now raised uh, when you guys are warming up. So the good news is that Marie and Margaret are here during the day. So if we ever get to a break, you, you know, please uh, reach out to them and they, they will be happy to answer more questions. And, and I, you know, I've so enjoyed this discussion with you and I think future is bright with entrepreneurs like you. So I'm gonna give you more power. And as a closing question ask, what's the one thing that, you know, if you could change in this world of uh, diversity and equality, what would you change? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. I think uh, one, of, one of the biggest ob obstacles that we have is that is our perception of it, is that we think that we are we, we think that we're all equal. We think that we uh, we have the same. We play in the same playing fields, um, and and uh, as long as we do give everyone the same measures or do the same thing for everyone, it's going to play play out the same way, which is not the case. So I think the one thing that I would have wanted to change is is that to be people to be aware of their biases, of their unconscious stereotypes, of of how we do treat we do treat people differently, and we don't want to do it, mm. but we do. Yes. Uh, and recognizing it is is. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful step in, in the journey of, of becoming more equal. That's so well said, like most change starts with awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Margaret? Like you said, I couldn't have said it any yeah. better. So maybe <laughs> add on top of it, you know, if we could r remove the regulatory burden, that would make my life easier. But thank you for your answer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for being here today and for the wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we continue with an uh, equally exciting topic and, and uh, as we're inviting Birger and the next uh, panelist uh, uh, on the stage, uh, I just wanted to say a few words to introduce the panel. So the name of our panel is what do we do differently in the post-post-cold war world and uh, this uh, discussion probably couldn't be more timely when we think about you know the situation in Ukraine and and the concerns that the whole world is having around things like cybersecurity how do you secure uh, your independence on, on energy and we have fantastic experts here today from food energy cyber and and and, and these topics so with that i would like to welcome birker and the next panel Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Okay. Yeah, so this is the point where we have one speaker who's supposed to be here, who's in his living room in uh, Palo Alto because he came down with COVID over the weekend. So we have one empty chair for, for Martin Mikos. Um, but before we get going, I, I mean, it's a long title to this panel, uh, and I just thought I'd say a few words about it. Uh, most of you who are here can probably remember um, a date. It might be November 7th, 1989. It might possibly be 25th or 26th of December, 1991, when uh, you know, the, the generation that had worried about things like a nuclear exchange took this collective sigh of relief, and um, the Cold War was over. And, and we, we called it the post-Cold War period. We knew we, was in it, we were in it. 
Um, we traded more, we traveled everywhere. Personally, I loaded up a 300, well, the biggest truck I could legally drive and with, with office furniture and drove over to Vilnius, Lithuania and, and set up an office there. Um, so, so that was a period that, we can debate how long it lasted and I think Maria and Pekka here have different perspectives on, on that question, we'll come back to it. But somewhere between back then and today, the post-Cold War period ended. And um, what do we think of it as a situation today where the West is in conflict with Russia or we can think perhaps bigger geopolitical blocks around it as well in the longer term? Uh, we're definitely in a different paradigm for how to think about a lot of questions we have taken for granted over the last 30 years. So this panel um, sort of put together to try to examine questions we might have to think differently about in the light of, of innovations, practical innovations, um, that are being developed and deployed uh, as we speak. And uh, we've focused in on four different areas. Uh, first one, and we're going to have Jaron speak about that in a second, is energy. Uh, how do we create energy independence for, for Europe in the short and long term? Uh, second one is information integrity and information security. How do we believe what we believe? How can we trust what we read? And Maria is here to talk about that. Um, third is, is cyber security. Uh, how can we secure not only our physical infrastructure, but the digital one that we've become to so reliant on? And then finally, Pekko is going to talk a little bit about um, food security. Um, and, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about the personal experiences of both Maria and Pekko, who um, perhaps uh, could be thought of as the first person to leave Russia and the last. Uh, and that cryptic statement will gain meaning in the next 45 minutes. But first of all, I hope I have Jaron with me, and I actually have to turn around to see you. Jaron, and I, I'm here. Yeah, there you I'm are. I'm here. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Super. I'm here too. Uh, Martin, I hope you're feeling okay. I'm good. I tested negative for COVID this morning, so I'm in great shape. I'm just not allowed to fly to Seattle, so sorry I can't be there, but everything else is good. All right. Fantastic. So, without further ado, Jaron, uh, you are, one might argue, at least one of the experts that get asked most often in, in matters of energy supply and security. Uh, we met uh, many years ago, but uh, when we started talking about your business today, you had a little Excel spreadsheet with, with data about most of the subsoil resources um, in, on the Eastern Hemisphere at that point, I think, and you founded a business based on that Excel sheet that's called Rista Energy. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and then we can get to the perspective on energy independence. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Birgit. You were actually the first one that really educated me about uh, the oil and gas business when we worked together on the first project in McKinsey many years ago. Um, but uh, after being in McKinsey for many years, uh, working on a lot of these uh, big mergers, etc., I was not really content with the energy information uh, and uh, tried to convince them to set up a business to have basically build a, a complete uh, uh, description, a digital twin of the energy landscape. But they thought that was completely unrealistic. But I really had this idea. So in 2004, I founded this uh, com company. We got all oil and gas fields globally into this. But I called the company Riser Energy because I knew that over time, oil and gas would not be the key thing. It would be new energy forms. And here we are today, over the last five years, we have really been building up, uh, including all solar assets, wind assets, battery plants, hydrogen, electrolyzers, etc. basically every single asset that is producing or consuming energy in this digital twin of the energy world. So here we are today with uh, 408 employees and 25 offices globally. Fantastic. Let's see if I can, I'll, I'll be your personal clicker for today, Aaron. So see if I can yes. advance the, your slides here. Good. Does it work so, so let's then, uh, then get into the energy situation in Europe and uh, connect them to, uh, to the, to the en energy situation. So I, I think this is at least not the presentation I've made, but uh, 
maybe if you get that. Uh, that That's one. actually <laughs> the next one. So um, can we find the? Yeah. Uh, so starting yeah. with the blue slides with Russia on it. But this uh, is number two. Nevertheless, I can, can start to, to talk a little bit. There we are, right. there we are. Perfectly. So let's go to the next slide. And here we really see the issue for Europe. What you see here is that the green bar is the energy production. The red bar is the energy consumption. And then the orange bar is then the balance. And in Europe, there are two net energy exporters. Well, Belarus and Albania doesn't really count. So it's Russia and Norway. And we have a lot of surplus energy. And every other country in Europe are energy importers. And they are importing up to 74% or 81% even from Greece of the energy they need. So they are depending on other nations. And they are primarily depending on Russia. So, and if you stop the energy over, over, over a night, you will also stop all the activity in a society. So we are really dependent on that energy. So concretely, Russia supplies 35% of the oil that Europe is needing, 30% of uh, the gas, and also uh, about 35% of the coal and usually coal used to be the mean of energy security for every nation because that they had locally and they were importing gas and they were importing oil and uh, just to jump to one conclusion uh, renewables will be the new coal in terms of uh, energy security because renewables is also uh, domestic but in this situation with Ukraine, of course, we have uh, we, we need to put on the foot, not accept to import uh, energy from an aggressor like Russia, and we need to, as fast as possible, get independent. It's easier to get independent on the oil side because that is a global traded market, and most of this oil is, uh, in double sense, a liquid. So you can move it around in the, on the oceans. But the, the methane molecules are transported by pipelines. And it's much more integrated in the infrastructure. So it's not easy to, get, uh, uh, to, to, to change that energy system very fast. So let's then move to the next slide. And then you will see uh, basically uh, all the gas imported to Europe. The red part here is the gas from Russia. It's about 30%, as I said. And you see the mix in each country, and you see the, the, the breadth of it is, is basically the total. So for example, Germany is 90 BCM. It's the biggest part here. So you see the biggest is Germany. This is number two is Italy. And then there's a lot of, of smaller countries. And we want to get independent of Russia. We want to stop all of this energy. But what will happen? And what, is, what has already happened? Well, let me start to click one forward just on the animation. Then you will see that five countries has already stopped importing. Uh, if you click one forward, uh, you will see that, uh, yes, that five countries has already stopped importing or being cut off from Russian gas. Uh, Poland is the most important, but the Baltic countries and Bulgaria. If you click more, more forward, we will see that another three countries has promised to get rid of all the Russian gas by the end of this year. If you click forward one more time, we will see that the two most important countries, uh, Italy and Germany, they have committed to get rid of uh, Russian gas by 2024 and 2025, respectively. And this will be extremely hard. Uh, they have to use all kinds of innovations and uh, all kinds of new sources uh, to get there. So, but uh, if you click one forward, we will see that this is about 65% uh, of all the energy uh, imported from Russia to Europe. So click, let's click one more forward. Uh, then I was challenged by Birgit, what if we really have to cut 100% of the gas by the end of 2022? How bad would it be for Europe? 
So meaning then from the 1st of January 2023, no Russian gas looking forward. Well, then we have to do two things. We have to find alternative sources of gas and we have to reduce uh, uh, demand for gas. And we have looked uh, into this in detail and the short story is that it is possible, but it will be extremely painful. It will hurt, especially for Germany and Italy. Uh, but the new sources will be that we are fully utilizing the LNG terminals, we are building new uh, LNG receiving terminals, we are reopening fields in uh, Europe, uh, sorry, in, in UK and Norway, and we have a gigantic field in Netherlands, Groningen field, that only uh, nine years ago produced 60 BCM, last year 6 BCM, because they have subsidence, so the city above it is actually falling a little bit and they have a lot of problems with basements being have fractures etc so the city council has said no more gas production we are destroying the buildings i think this can be a wild card in this uh, to get rid of uh, russian gas we must accept more problems in the basements of those small societies we, we must give them a lot of compensation and let them live with this situation for another two to three years then we actually might be able to be innovative and be independent there uh, of, of Russian gas. But you also have to reduce uh, demand for gas and uh, the chemical production and pulp and paper production to basically stop that and rather import chemicals and pulp and paper could be the way. But 330,000 Germans are engaged in the chemical industry and we expect that these people will uh, not be able to work then for uh, a year or two uh, and the german economy is likely to go into recession so this is a very high price uh, to pay for a short-term energy independence but longer-term energy independence i think is actually quite realistic and we are already started uh, on this track uh, and uh, uh, here again we have to use all the tools we have in the energy transition toolbox which is solar panels rooftop utility scale it is uh, heat pumps uh, replace the gas uh, heater with a, with a, with the heat pumps with a rooftop hot water etc just i was also asked what is the implications for russia on, on their economy so let's then move uh, another slide forward again um if, if you we will then see uh, is, is it an alternative for the gas from russia can they rather go to uh, asia and then uh, receive the same payment uh, this is quite complicated chart with all the pipelines but the short story here is that only about one third of the gas that is fed to Europe can change uh, destination to Asia by 2030. And today, almost nothing. So this is really going to be a big loss for Russia. It's more easy for Russia to evacuate their uh, oil. But uh, for gas, Russia is likely to lose 40, 50, 60 billion dollars every year and with the gas prices today more than much more than 100 but we don't expect these gas prices to to, to remain so uh, we are talking about russia losing uh, 15 percent uh, maybe 20 percent of their uh, uh, total export income uh, due to this situation while for the oil side they will more easily be able to circumvent europe and get the oil directly to india or china and others other countries that are willingly taking taking this oil okay so in terms of uh, total uh, gas export then from russia and this is such a sad situation because russia had a very positive development they had plans to uh, to use hydrogen into this so if you move on one slide forward they had the north stream 2 ready to be produced so it was actually quite positive uh, out, uh, outlook for the income to russia if they hadn't done this gigantic failure that they just did in uh, in Ukraine, and the intellectual people in Russia, they they saw this, and of course, they're 99% of the people I've talked to, of course, is extremely disappointed and, and sad about this situation. So, if you move on forward, we see that this was 
uh, what it could have been, this is what is going to be. So we're talking about 4,000 BCM lost uh, and trillion, one to two trillion dollars lost income to Russia, uh, in addition to all the other issues that they see. Okay, let's move another slide forward. And uh, we are, so the short-term effect will be that we have to be innovative, basically, just to get alternative sources of supply and very short-term demand destruction. But longer term, this event is clearly uh, triggering the speed of the energy transition. So like you see here from Germany, they are tripling their ambitions in solar and doubling their ambitions in wind uh, for the next eight years. So, uh, and uh, if you move on uh, slide forward, uh, this is then the solution in terms of carbon dioxide emissions that is uh, consistent with the IPCC budgets. And uh, we uh, try to see which of these tracks, and this is every decimal degree of global warming, is most likely. I think the solution space is here. It's between 1.4 degree global warming to 2.2 degrees global warming. And then we are looking at the technologies that could deliver uh, this change. The solar PV is the most important. Number two is uh, wind. Number three is the electric vehicle. And number four is the batteries. And batteries, not only for vehicles, but for uh, be using to deal with the intermittency. And just to then get towards my conclusion here, that uh, do we have to give up this uh, climate ambitions due to the situation in, uh, with Russia and that we suddenly don't, don't have a need to reopen coal fields, etc. Well, the most important driver is, as I said, the speed of deployment of solar. And working with the uh, Chinese manufacturers of uh, solar panels, we are seeing that they are actually increasing their capacities fast enough to deliver not on the 1.4 or the 1.5, but actually to the 1.6 degree ramp up that you see here. So uh, still, I think it is realistic and reasons to believe that we are on track for 1.6 degrees in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. But there's an upside, which is the um, uh, methane reduction that is not accounted for in the IPCC's budgets. So with that upside, we could actually land on uh, a 1.5 degree scenario. And part of uh, this ramping up of speed of deployment of solar is just happening now as a result of this situation in Europe, like you just saw for this example from Germany. So then to have the, the last slide uh, now to see this is the energy mix towards 2100 from 1965. So from the top, it is solar and then wind, hydropower, geothermal and biomass. And those five renewable sources are all most, most, much lower on the marginal operational cost. So meaning that when they are coming into the market, they will always push out fossil fuel. So in this way, uh, coal, oil and gas, the brownish colors here, will be outcompeted in the market. Uh, and solar and wind will be the key levers to do just that. And then my final slide but with the same graphics, if you move on forward, is uh, the same top line primary energy. But you see that primary energy is actually declining, but still the energy accessible to end users are increasing. And this is because fossil fuel have so much losses related to heat losses to the environment when you are burning fossil fuel to create work. And you don't have the same losses with uh, renewable energy. So even with a growing population and increased GDP, we will be able to deliver on these this climate targets now. So yeah, let me round off there and I'm uh, happy to have a discussion or follow up questions. So as promised, all the data on energy sources you could possibly wish for. Um, and you heard it. Uh, this will reduce Russian revenues from gas by a trillion dollars on current form. Uh, Russian defense budget is around 70 billion dollars. So that's 13, 14 years of a Russian defense budget. That's going to go away in this time horizon. And while we do this, 
we will be able to reach the 1.5 degree objective in the Paris Agreement. So some very good reasons to be optimistic from the energy independence side, I think, Jaron. Although the, yes. the, the short term picture looked demanding. Yes, I, I think so. I, I think there will be a compromise here. Uh, to, to, to avoid some of the short-term suffering, especially in, in the countries I mentioned. Um, even if you don't like those molecules, we right. in one way have to consume them. Thank you. We'll change, uh, change tack a little bit and go to the, the information space. Um, so, at least over the last half of this period that we call the post-Cold War, the um, what we've seen is something else going on that we discussed a little bit in the prior panel, which is the weaponization of algorithms uh, to manipulate our information stream as, as consumers. And um, we can go through a long list of potential consequences that that has created. Um, but I'd, I'd much rather hear about somebody who's made it their business to fix it. And Maria Amelie? That is Factiverse, so tell us a little bit about your business and then we can go into the Thank wider you. perspectives afterwards. Do you think I can stand there? Because Absolutely, I'm, I'm gonna, and you can also take I'm this, gonna unplug this you, one. You can probably keep that, they can, they can dial sure. it down. It's, from, it's, uh, okay, it's, I'll it's, keep it here. Right. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, for the introduction. So, I have my notes. If you want the truth to go around the world, you must hire an express train to pull it. But if you want a lie to go around the world, it will fly. It is light as a feather, and it's a breath will carry it. That was said in 1855, and today it is still true. Although the situation is actually much worse, because lying, lying is a business. It's a big business, and there are many people who are profiteering on that. Democracies crumble. Stock market is volatile, and of course, um, there are, as we have seen with COVID-19, there are people who are actually getting sick and dying because of the spread of misinformation and also disinformation. And according to the Inter Stanford Internet Observatory, the supply of disinformation is going to be soon infinite because of the algorithms, as uh, Birger said as well, and the spread of, the, of it on social media. False information costs society quite a lot. Um, they're difficult to find really good numbers for that. Um, $78 billion, and uh, that includes some of the health challenges, the bureaucracy challenges, and also the, the uh, fall, the, the volatile stock market. And uh, there are almost more than one in two people who are concerned, online news consumers, who are concerned whether what they read online is true or, or not. That's a study by Reuters Digital News uh, Report with about uh, 80,000 respondents. And this affects uh, all of us, especially uh, businesses, because how can you make decisions if you don't have all the facts, all the information you need to, uh, in order to make decisions when it comes to investing, uh, impacting the society, and just contributing to a more sustainable future. So at Factiverse, we believe that the opposite of lying is not necessarily the truth. Because what is the truth? That's, that's not something algorithm can really show us, and we shouldn't rely on algorithms to do that. Uh, yes, COVID vaccines are, are safe, but what you really want as a both decision maker and news consumer is to be able to understand what are the, the different sides to, to the story, what are the different opinions, so that you can make up your own mind uh, instead of just following and living the life in the one filter bubble that you are exposed, exposed to by uh, often social media. So we believe that and we see that there is a huge trend that is um, developing. It's not about assessing what is true or false, but actually giving people uh, a choice and empowering users to understand the different, the different perspective. Is this uh, article coming from a partisan website? Is it from a blog? Uh, which, what are the different agendas of the sources of the information? And which sources have in the past have been uh, labeled as, as highly credible and which have been less credible? And I think 
Um, that's also something that MIT studies uh, show that if you empower users to see the different sides of the story, they actually become less polarized because they understand. We, we want to understand, right? We don't want someone else to tell us this is how thing is, this is true and this is not. So we are aiming to become an industry standard in fact-checking and empower first and foremost journalists, uh, analysts in, in finance sector and industries, and eventually consumers to see the different sides of the story. Our tech is built on, um, um, on a AI and natural language processing, and we're careful what, da what data we put in our AI to train because we have a responsibility when we work with this topic. Um, we are getting traction with some um, uh, media conglomerates in the Nordics and the investment firms who are concerned about the greenwashing and false information about the climate. And um, we have quite a good team. Uh, my co-founder is uh, uh, Vinay Sethi. He's associate professor in machine learning uh, here in the university in Stavanger. And I wish I could say that this topic is, um, is business, but it's, it's not just business, it's personal for me. Uh, I was born in uh, uh, North uh, Ossetia, which is uh, um, a little repu republic in, in Russia, very close to Georgia and Armenia. And uh, in the end of 90s, um, the politics in Russia started to change. Uh, suddenly it was uh, not the, the euphoria of the perestroika, but uh, things were starting to get different. And my parents, who were entrepreneurs, both of them, lost absolutely everything. So one day, I was, uh, in 2000, I was in the Red Cross in Helsinki um, saying words I, would, I thought I would never say. We are refugees and we are asking for asylum. So we applied for asylum in Finland. Mapuhan vahan Suomea. Unfortunately. Kitos. Well, unfortunately, the Finnish authorities didn't did not think that we should stay in, in Finland. And after six months, we were rejected and fled over the border uh, uh, to, uh, um, to the n north of Norway, where again applied for asylum. And being a refugee, basically a political refugee from Russia in the beginning of 2000 was, was not a cool thing to do. It was not possible in the Nordics. Um, and I think the media was more concerned about um, the memes of President Putin in his uh, bear uh, back on a horse than actually putting in the different sides of the story. Norway rejected us as well. <laughs> so I stayed in, in, uh, in Norway for almost seven years uh, as undocumented, or as you call dreamer, here in the US. I, did, was allowed, I was allowed to study at the university. I, d I finished the university, and I s decided I have to fix things my own way, because there was no, no help. Um, and uh, I wrote a book, um, which is called U Illegally Norwegian, where I just put my face on the book. I came out and tell, told my story. Um, that led to quite a lot of uh, attention in the Norwegian media in 2011, which led to me being uh, uh, deported uh, out of Norway because I was there in the country without any documents, although I had a strong connection. And um, what happened is that <laughs> there were so many people who reacted, uh, who were really, really angry with uh, uh, that I was deported, there was demonstrations. Um, the Icelandic uh, MPs and writers suggested that I should get a residency. Um, there was a lot of attention all over the world. The, the Polish government uh, tried to give me um, a residency as a persecuted uh, writer. And the uh, Norwegian Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg was not very happy with me. Um, but luckily, because of the so much attention and so much basically democracy in practice, I was allowed, I was allowed to return back to Norway. And in three months, um, the Stoltenberg went on for a compromise uh, between the opposing parties and a new law was introduced called Lex Amelie, which allows streamers to stay in, in Norway. One thing I learned throughout this journey is that never take democracy for granted. When I was in Russia, the, when I was deported to Russia and, and the journalists were looking at the demonstrations that were organized for me in, in um, in Norway, they said, oh, that's so sweet, that's so naive to go and demonstrate for something you believe. I don't think so. I think that's one of the things you learn in the Nordic. That's an important value. We should take it with us. And I think the better our lives are, it's the easier it is to say, well, democracy is a nice thing. Just, we, we have it. Let's just, uh, we don't need to work for it, which is not true. We, we have to work really, really hard. 
And I think and truly believe that's why to make informed decisions uh, for democracy and for sustainable future, you need facts. You need to see the different sides of the story. Because after all, our future depends on it. And we don't know what's coming next. Thank you. So that's, that's a hard act to follow, Martin. Um, but uh, I know you as, a, as an extremely uh, deep thinker. And, and um, the, the question I was going to ask you uh, was more technical around the state of, of cyber in the world and you know, how, we, how you see that evolve. But I'll, I'll actually just give you the floor to, to share your, your perspectives on you know, what are the innovations we will need uh, to, to, to make world safe for, for open democracies in the next decade or so. Thank you, Birger, and thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Morten Mikkos. I'm the CEO of HackerOne, a cybersecurity company. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I am there fully with my whole mind. I'm in absolutely, absolutely in awe of what Maria just told us, and and she is solving problems of human beings and society. Uh, I am a simple nerd. We solve problems with software that's insecure and <laughs> software that has vulnerabilities. So much, much uh, more uh, limited scope of, of the job and therefore more doable. So we'll talk about cybersecurity for a few minutes here and, and then engage in the, in the conversation. When it comes to cybersecurity, the, the practice, the business, it is a I told you so industry. And what I mean is that whenever something bad happens in cybersecurity, it was always predicted. Always predicted a long time ago, always predicted by several experts. There's nothing terrible that has happened in cybersecurity that we who are in the industry didn't anticipate. That's a sad truth, that we, we can see how bad it will get, but it's, we are just unable to get people and systems to put themselves in shape for the risks we are facing. And because of this, it's also true that the only sustainable improvement in cybersecurity is a preventative action. We tend to look at cyber breaches and digital attacks and, and we see them on, in movies and in the media and we think it's about facing the adversary when bad things happen. It's not at all true. To have any chance on cybersecurity, we have to take preventative action, boring action, long before the risk will happen. Um, so, so in our field, there are surprises in cybersecurity, but it's only positive surprises. The, the only times we are surprised is when something actually works or somebody fixes something very quickly. But all the bad things happening have been anticipated for a long time. And, and now when we have a terrible, terrible situation in Ukraine, and as, as Yaran said, a gigantic failure by Russia, it, it causes indescribable pain and suffering for the Ukrainian people. So that in itself is just terrible. But as a side effect, it will also increase cyber attacks and cyber crime all over the world. And in ways that are broader than the actual uh, war that is waged there. Because unfortunately, cyber crime behaves like armed conflict, meaning that the more there are angry young men, the more such attacks they are and the more damaging they are. And it's, of course, not just angry young men who are to blame, but, but the, the presence of resentment increases the danger enormously. And we will have resentment in the world now on any side of that war. We will have resentment in other countries. We, will, we have other countries who are sympathizing or antagonizing. We have uh, China isolating itself today. So we have geopolitical changes that cause a lot of resentment among people who understand computers. And even if many or most of them are, have good, pure intent, some will be forced or feel justified to 
to engage in in uh, cyber criminal behavior. So, so the story is that we know of all the risks. We know how ransomware, how to fight it. We know about stealing credentials, how, how to fight it. We know about uh, DDoS attacks and how to fight them. All these techniques are known and the defense is known. We are now certain that the, the level of cyber attacks will increase. Maybe not this very day, because a lot of the, the energy and resources are used in the actual kinetic war, but over time, uh, some of that, uh, the conflict and resentment will spread into other parts and hit totally innocent organizations and countries. So we have some time to, to get our, uh, our things in shape until it gets much worse, but it will get worse. There's no other future now than one with with clearly increased uh, cyber attacks and cyber crime and, and cyber incidents. So, so then we say, what should we do? Is, it, is there anything we can do? And, and the problem with cybersecurity is that most people are not experts on it. It's difficult to know how to, to defend yourself and big resist, build resistance to attack when you are not sure about how the technology actually works. So the whole list of advice to anybody is very long and it will be specific for any recipient, but there are some things we all should be doing. One is realize that it's preventative action we must take. So do something today, don't wait, don't postpone. Even a small thing today is much better than a panicked reaction tomorrow. A second thing is we must make cybersecurity a matter for everybody. We used to dreamingly think that we can have cybersecurity experts who take care of it for us. Not true. We need cybersecurity experts, and without them, we have no chance. But it must become a common uh, initiative for all of us. You need to train every single employee of your organization in basic cyber hygiene, in basic cyber actions. And there is just one way to do cybersecurity, and it is together. That is the power we have that no adversary has, meaning we can band together, we can share information, we can share observations, we can share defense tools. We're already seeing it. Uh, it's not visible to the public eye, but g going back to Ukraine, there's been a lot of attacks on various parts of the Ukrainian digital infrastructure, and nothing really, really bad has happened. Because months before the war started, they were getting help from other places, specifically from the US government and large American tech companies who went in there to assess and help and improve uh, Ukraine and build the defenses for the coming onslaught, which they knew would come. So we're already showing that working together, we can solve any threat. But we have to keep doing it. And like I said, everybody has to take cybersecurity as their own priority, just like we all take uh, responsibility in the COVID case. We must all wear a face mask. We must all wash our hands, whatever we do. It's the experts will produce the vaccines and the medications, but every human being must be part of fighting the threat. And it's exactly the same with, with, uh, with cyber uh, tra threats and the cyber attacks we're facing. So that's, that's how we just must do it. Uh, today, if you operate a company and you don't have many cybersecurity experts, fortunately, the vendors can help you very, very well. If you run your digital, your applications and your digital assets on a public cloud vendor, they will support you and defend you better than anybody. And there are other major cybersecurity vendors uh, who know how to deal with it, you can quickly step in and help. So the, the, the help is actually uh, pretty near for anybody who is ready for it. And like I said, we have a little bit of time. So if we start now, we will be in much better shape. Another learning of cybersecurity is that we must see that as probabilistic uh, risk management. There is no complete security or complete safety, never. We can only aspire to become a little bit better every single day. So we must think in probabilities. 
you can go to your security leader if you have one, if you have a CISO and say, what is the risk of major breach in the next six months for our organization? And the person should have an opinion. And you can go there tomorrow and say, and what is it now? And over some time, the risk should be going down because the organization is taking measures. But maybe the risk starts at 50% and then it sinks to 44%. Even that is a good improvement for any company. So, so those are our generic uh, pieces of advice on what we can do. More broadly, our civilization is becoming digital and we are unequipped to deal with it. Uh, the old Vikings said, Landskalme lag bygjas, that you build your civilization with rules and laws. But we haven't done it for the digital side. We are building a whole new uh, civilization that's digital, and we have been unable to determine how to ensure truth, facts, democracy, justice, rights, fairness, protection, safety, privacy. The, the laws and rules we have today are primitive uh, compared to the advancement of technology. So we have to pass smart, modern laws that are made for the digital world, not the physical world. There we have a huge job for all of society to catch up with the civilization we're already entering. Our children are born into the digital world and we don't give them proper legal protection. So we need to st stipulate the laws and the rules to make it work. And then we need to take control over technology and make it our servant, not our master. AI will help us solve many of these problems, but we need to make sure that AI, and as it is self-learning and evolving itself, that it stays true to the moral and ethical principles that we decided. Because software is the ultimate expression of human intent, always. There is no software that does not represent human intent. And we must make sure that our intent is known by the software and heard by the software so that even as it evolves and learns and optimizes and moves faster than we can think, the software will stay true to the founding principles, the intent that we had. It's very difficult. I don't know how to solve it technically. I'm also in no doubt about the possibility. We can solve it we, and we need to solve it. So, so that's what I have to say, and I'll, I'll end here with, with noting that I've learned now in this cybersecurity space that if advice is really, really good, it is always boring. <laughs> there is no exciting advice in cybersecurity, because if it is exciting, it's irrelevant. And if it is relevant, it is by definition boring. So if you ever get boring cybersecurity advice, think about it and consider that it might actually be the best advice you ever received. So thank you here from my little studio and back uh, to everybody there and happy to continue the conversation. I think that's bad news. Well. <laughs> I think that's bad news, Martin, because I'm not sure you know how to be boring. But, yeah, I know, um, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that they accepted me this company uh, <laughs> to run a cybersecurity company with this uh, positive mindset. But we have, at HackerOne, if I may promote our company a little bit, we have delivered to our customers over 200,000 uh, security vulnerabilities that they have fixed so far. So we have contributed quite a lot to the strengthening of our digital, digital assets all over the world. But that's not the topic of the day, but you did bring it up, Birger, so I took the opportunity. Well, I mean, and so, so if I understand correctly, I mean, there's been some speculation about whether the, the feared Russian cyber capability was, uh, how should you put it, uh, you know, as inflated as the, the view of perhaps both the opponents and the, the, the Russian leadership itself uh, of its own kinetic war capability. Um, and that's why we haven't seen the massive cyber attacks. But I think you were saying that, well, no, actually, it's that we were very well prepared. We did all the boring stuff before things got really gnarly, and therefore, we haven't seen these massive attacks that many people were speculating on. Is that a fair summary? Ab absolutely. Like the, the capabilities of criminal or nation-sponsored groups in Russia is absolutely astonishing. Like, they are so good that we have to be very, very worried. But let me also be clear, it's not just Russia. 
I agree that Russia is the number one aggressor in the whole world right now, but, but it would be naive to think that they represent the, the totality of the threat. There's a threat landscape much broader with groups in other countries who are with Russia, against Russia, or have resentment for some other, or justification for some other reason. So, so it's, it can be useful to look at Russia because it's such a stark example, but in the true assessment of risk, we have to look globally. And there are advanced persistent threat groups in many other countries that are, are, will soon be equally dangerous and, uh, and, and like sophisticated as the, as the Russian ones. <clears throat> Thank you. So moving on to our fourth leg of the stool today, um, food security. Um, I'd like to introduce Pekka Viljakainen, also known as the bulldozer. I have it on good authority that I was baptized by Steve Ballmer here in Seattle uh, in 1996. Correct, sir. Um, the governor asked us last night, uh, as, as I think it was Ingvar um, Petrosson and, and Pekka, who was standing around the boat, are there any examples of tech entrepreneurs who have started investing in sustainable business? And uh, of course, three hands went up. Uh, Pekka, why don't you tell us what you've been doing since you didn't quite retire, but refocused from, from being the tech enfant terrible of, uh, of Finland and, and Tieto? Yeah, thank you, Birger. Maria, first, I need to say that I'm also a nerd. <laughs> but big, uh, like Birger, we are brothers, uh, with, with Morten, like Morten and uh, Finnish nerds. Mm. But because Morten was much more handsome and clever, he ended up to California. IT business all my life and and actually uh, also being boring and uh, but then about 11 years ago when I retired and I was wondering two weeks what to do because <laughs> retirement as such is relatively boring nothing to do there is no management meetings nothing my wife started to kind of say that I should invent something so I started invent, uh, investing uh, companies and I have so far invested about 30 companies I don't look like an angel, but I'm kind of a business angel. <laughs> and one of the most prominent one, I would say, well, we have done some exits, and, and that's, they, my family thinks that I'm a genius already. But what I want to talk today is actually such an exciting and sexy story about fish. I'm, I'm sad that some of the friends from Reykjavik already left because this was targeted to them. Because I personally believe and please record this date and this month and this year that within 10 years all traditional fish farming of the world will end. 1995, I said in the Redmond Microsoft campus that in 10 years all the banking will be done in internet because I was programming with my tiny hands the world's world first internet bank and even Bill and Steve said that not in America, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> even my mother said to me in 1995 that nobody wants to use internet paying bills because they want to go to offices and meet other people. <laughs> my mother is a lovely person, uh, but she was wrong with that. <laughs> Regarding fish, uh, about six years ago, I was fooled to be an angel investor on the land-based, land-based, fish farming technologies, where you have to solve the problem of this mission, having a super healthy food, no waste, no emissions, zero use of antibiotics, everything, energy coming from solar, wind, bioenergy, and industrial scale. Because as of today, the fish industry is 300 billion euro business. You can argue is it big or small, but I think it's big even in the Finnish scale, uh, and uh, <clears throat> only less than a percent of it, less than a percent of fishing and fish farming is done in a sustainable way. So if you check any industry of the world, I mean if food industry or any industry, you cannot find industry which has not been disrupted at all, but fish is, because the big fish producers of the world are hanging tough, they want to stop the development. It's like five years ago when in Las Vegas, the chairman of Mercedes-Benz said that 
the coming decade is the decade of diesel engines. Same happens in fish as of today while we speak. So what we have done actually, we were, first of all, we were suffering a lot. I, I, I promised to my wife five years ago that, honey, I give two million euros and two years of my time to solve the problem. So far, I have put five years and 25 million euros. We are still married. I mean, she's okay. I mean, <laughs> they, this is normal kind of family talks. Uh, but but there, there, are, there are kind of a three cornerstone. Everything starts from the genetics and selective breeding. So we have to really have a healthy fish which survives without any medication. Secondly, you need, a, sorry for my English, shitload of software to, to, to analyze the animal health, to analyze the process, to, to, to own the whole story. And then last but not least, you have to educate the world to eat fresh fish. Because people are, there are more single households than ever before. People don't want to buy a whole fish. Young people, teenagers, they a little bit, fish is not so cool. So we have to solve these all three problems. And to make it happen, I was, it was stolen with pride from Elon Musk, an idea of gigafactories. And we built the first gigafactory in Finland, and we are now holding the world record on efficiency of growing millions of fish without any medication, everything done under one roof, and there are consumer products are leaving from this small door on the right side, about 170,000 fish fillet per day. Uh, just to understand the scale, this is uh, four times the football arena, the size of it. And I am standing there on the right, flying the drone, taking the photo. It's, I'm like a fly there. This is what we are doing, and I personally believe, and I repeat myself, and then we can talk some other stuff. The whole world, including the United States, has to guarantee the food safety, secure the food supply of ultra-fresh, healthy products with the zero emissions. And some might say that it's not possible. I say it's, not po it's definitely possible. And you can come to Finland and see it, how it works. And soon such a factories, gigafactories, will be built around the world. That's what we are doing because retired, boring people like myself have to do something to do, I mean, for the rest of the life. Thank you. So, so in a sense, more good news, um, Becca. We can, we can solve at least long-term food security with reduced emissions. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had another career too, and I wanted to get into that, because mm -hmm. uh, short term, there, there are many people who believe that wars get won by logistics, not strategy. But in the, in the long term geopolitical conflict, um, and I think it's been observed about the decline of the original Soviet Union that this was a problem, because conflict of that nature is won by innovation. Mm -hmm. So whichever society is producing more of it will have the upper hand in the long run. You were the chief advisor to the Russian government on innovation until what date? December. Right. And you were a board member of the Skolkova project. Of Skolkova and, and the Post Bank in Russia until Correct. March, no, uh, yeah, February, February 24th. Correct. All right. So, Suffice it to say, you have some background to know what you're talking about. Um, who's got the better innovative ecosystem and capability? Yeah, so like so many times before, when United States and Russia wants to do something together, like 11 years ago, US and Russia decided to make a joint innovation project, they need somebody to be in the middle. And so many times it has come from Finland. And I had just retired, and I don't know how they randomly selected, because there was joint friends from Google Boss and from Intel was and the, and in the US side, and then Russian side. So they called to me that we need totally independent person who is not Russian, who is not American but who can be in the middle watching innovation purely from the business standpoint. 
And I didn't know anything about Russia, honestly speaking. <laughs> not a single word of Russian language, nothing. And I went to Moscow. I thought that we are negotiating, but there was already an order said that, do it. And I said, this is kind of interesting. There was both American and Russian parties saying that, you have been appointed. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so I have been in 110 Russian cities in the past 11 years, in 10 time zones, so I know something about the country. I've been working with the young people, uh, 20, 30 years old, young entrepreneurs, university students, professors, on the, in the area of innovations. And uh, of course, everything what has happened now, it's such a heartbreaking thing because millions of the, those people with whom I've been working, I can say millions because it, it's a really large group, they, they have kind of lost their future, so to say. So there, there is absolutely nothing to, positive to say about the current development. Having said that, uh, it's absolutely true that one day this era of Cold War will change and then there is another, th how do you reborn things? And then you need that generation and you need those innovators and you need those people which have actually now, most of them have escaped from Russia. They are now like in, in Fred, neighbors of Morten in Silicon Valley or they are in Seattle or they are in Dubai or wherever they are. But, but this generation is definitely needed by any country to reborn. And innovations are definitely needed, but, but as of now, it's uh, basically impossible to operate at all. I mean, totally. I have also been uh, very instrumental in the collaboration with MIT here. So I've been an advisor for MIT, building the joint university, jun uh, university education exchange programs, which are now, of course, all been frozen since February. But it's, it's a really sad not only because of Russia, but it's also sad from the Europe standpoint because we need talent to be able to exchange, exchange ideas. And there is no doubt that there is a great knowledge about not only hacker technologies, but the real heavy software and other technologies what should benefit the world in general, so to say, I mean globally. So, but currently the situation is totally frozen and I, of course, sincerely hope that that it would be solved as quickly as possible and there would be peace, but I would say nothing positive in the horizon as of today, unfortunately. On that note, um, I'm actually going to uh, look to you, who's been listening to these four fantastic stories, um, to hear if there are any, any questions that you'd like to, to ask for very different, but. Uh, very impactful innovators with, with Nordic links. See a hand back there? Can you take a mic? Because otherwise the, the folks watching remotely can't hear the question. Oh, this is for Martin. Martin, you said that the um, Russia had pretty strong uh, cyber attack abilities. What about their own defenses? And um, are you seeing that happen at all where there's been maybe a banding together of some of these hackers to um, play a little quid pro quo with Russia? Does that make sense? Did you pick up the question, Martin? Yeah, that's a, a great question. You could, uh, there is offensive hacking and defensive hacking, and offensive is trying to break somebody else's system, and defensive is you try to improve a system. Uh, my company is engaged only in defensive hacking, and we don't think there's anything that makes the world a better place other than strengthening the software we have. Uh, we understand that when there is a, a war, uh, any action or any methods will be tried out and, and therefore it's understandable that there's offensive hacking and it can give either party a benefit, there's no doubt about it. But in, in the more generic sense, it does not improve, make the world a better place. It may help uh, determine the outcome of a, of a war or a conflict. So, so therefore, we, my company and me, we are not at all engaged in any of that. We are more like the the Red Cross that we are, we are servicing 
any patient and striving for health rather than lack of health, health of software and, and not lack of health. But you're right, there are, there are uh, offensive hacking initiatives and the, uh, there have been reports on them having been um, very successful in some cases. But whatever, but even that is a risk for everybody because it reminds us how vulnerable we are. So if you think about the, the long-term effects, it means that if, if offensive hacking is possible, then it, it could be possible for somebody to offensively hack you. So my, my recommendation remains, we should strengthen our own digital assets and make them as resistant to digital attack as possible. Mark, okay. can I comment this? Well, this, this, this hacking issue, is, uh, the security issue is very important and I just need to tell you my view on it because I have a totally normal mobile phone. I'm not the normal guy because I have basically unlimited technical resources because I'm a nerd and I used to have 20,000 nerds. If I ask them to help me, I mean all over the Europe and USA, they help me. I just want to tell you that I have had the same mobile phone number since 94. It's the shortest phone number in the planet. And I have been, there has been hacking attempts to the phone from about 55 countries in past 12 months. I mean, thousands of those. I'm not, under, I'm not playing down the Russia at all, because a lot of those are coming from Russia. But I'm saying that many nations and many people would like to know what is happening in my mobile phone. And I have taken a role of the security uh, already in the 90s. And Morten knows it very, very well. I said it in one public event in Las Vegas that if everything what is in my digital device, mo mo mobile phones or laptop, would be published tomorrow on internet or on Financial Times. All the images, all the swimsuit images, everything, <laughs> all the documents, all the transactions, even in the worst scenario, that would be just embarrassing. And, and that's the way, I, I know that the countries and nations cannot do it. If you have patient records or hospital or military, you have to be absolutely certain. But I'm saying is that, that being traveling, connecting with the Wi-Fi's tomorrow in Chicago, next day in London, uh, connecting, it's, it's, it's a, such a battle, the whole security stuff, that, that you have to ha make your way of living in the sense that you are in a relatively transparent world, whatever you do. And then when I don't want to be transparent, I just shut it off and I go to my island, take two, two bottles of beer and went to sauna. Then I'm there. I mean, that's the only way to be. To, and even in the sauna, I don't know if there is some sensors there. But in yours? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. So now, now I must step in because Peck always gives good reason for debate. And he is, <laughs> and, 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 and Morten, it is Morten, true. Morten, you have been in a sauna. That's why you want to come in this. It is, it is true that many of us can say, if my data is exposed, it's only embarrassment. Hmm. But it's a, it's a failure of society because all you have to be is a dissident and underrepresented minority or something else, and you cannot afford that. Mm. So when we talk about privacy, it is to protect those who have no other protection mm. and not to protect those who can afford the exposure. So we, we must take privacy very, very seriously, no matter how uh, ready many of us would be to share our information because some just absolutely cannot and their lives will be at danger. Very good. <laughs> Any more uh, questions from the audience? Yes, uh, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, first, thanks for a very stimulating session. Um, I think it's uh, noticeable that all of the panelists have some substantial experience, if I can use that term, with Russia. And we've heard this morning that there are going to be some very dramatic changes, not only to Europe, but to Russia. A trillion dollars loss to an economy is a rather significant event. So it seems very unlikely that there will be no response to this loss of a trillion dollars. Since all of you have some experience with Russia, I'd be very interested in any of your views on what a likely response will be, particularly from Russia. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a little clever here, and because I saw your hand, Jay, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, to ask your question and perhaps make the first commentary on this, on this statement. It strikes me you have perhaps a, an equally good background to answer. Well, I know, uh, Birger, you're uh, pointing to my background uh, as a former American diplomat, but I actually, my question was on energy, and it was uh, to Mr. Rustad, and but it was uh, more on the climate change aspect. I was curious, uh, when you talked about the 1.5 degree Celsius, uh, where you thought that we would get, you were the, the slide you were showing was Europe-based, but I'm assuming that your assumption is that that's a, uh, that's global. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to ask that question, but to respond to my colleague who's the board member here, I, obviously a trillion dollars, or uh, it was between one and two trillion over a course of a number of years, I know, but given the, Russia, the size of the Russian economy, which is large, but I think only a tenth the size of the U.S. economy, uh, a trillion dollars in the U.S. context is massive, and so you just kind of multiply that by 10 and you can, if we were to lose 10 or 20 trillion dollars over the course of a number of years in the United States, can imagine how devastating that would be. I just, I know that that is, uh, if it does turn out to be that way, um, this is, as you all have suggested, just devastating uh, for the Russian economy and for the, the people uh, who, like Pekka, has been working with and, and their livelihoods going forward. We'll take one more question and then we'll turn it back to the panel for closing comments. Is it the price of di diplomacy, this trillion dollar as well? All right, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you can, if you, if you fix the relationship between Russia and the world, there's a lot to gain for everyone, I think. There's, uh, there's almost you can put a price tag on the, on the diplomatic, uh, on, it, on the diplomats, we can fix this. How's that for a task for your profession, Jay? <laughs> Got a question, Lars. Yes, please. Your Honor, um, I am not in the high-tech industry, as I am having a company that is construction and real estate investment. And um, we talked about sort of the dependence of energy from Russia and, and so forth, and the problem that that creates, but also the effect that it will have on CO2 emission if we cannot complete sort of the goals for the. Um, for going to a green economy. And um, one thing that wasn't mentioned about the um, need for energy is there is also a way to get around it by saving on energy. And I just want to mention that we here in Seattle have a company in Sweden that is a leader in Sweden when it comes to reducing the pollution coming and the energy used in, in real estate, as we are one of the major developers of apartment buildings in Sweden, where we have introduced new technologies, even if we are a very conservative industry. And that is, we have con a concept of self-heating houses, where we reduce significantly the need for heating. And, and um, we also have, in cooperation with the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, developed a way to reduce the need of cement in making concrete, which basically reduced the need of cement with about 20% by mixing in um, agricultural products or rather um, waste from the, um, the, the agricultural industry into the cement. And that is something that is um, reducing the need for cement with about 20%. And we have just started building the first real project with this new, high, uh, new kind of cement. And so there is a lot to be done also on, on, on reducing the need for energy and CO2 emission. So, um, and there we have something going on here between Seattle and Sweden at this point in time, but which I'm sure will be expanded also to the other Nordic countries. So we are really looking forward to see the, the governor coming to the Nordic countries here this fall and showing what we can really do that can be sort of implemented here in the US too. So that was not a question.
there might be room for another. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. It's a very inspiring example, though. So with that, i just got the same order around the, the panel. So, Jaron, perhaps you could, you could start up again with a 15 to 20 second summary of yes. what you've taken out of this. Thank you. Just to clarify, my last four slides was global slides. Uh, and there were, when I was solving the global energy production, and also indicating uh, that what you indicated, the last uh, person asking question here, it's, I actually, or we see a peak energy demand that are quite soon due to energy efficiency. So basically every building will be much less energy requirement and even at some point a net producer. All the new uh, industri industrial sites that are built are producing much, uh, are needing much less energy. Uh, and also if you have all this innovation, even in Sweden, where we are, for example, producing uh, uh, carbon dioxide free steel, you know, using hydrogen with SSAB. So uh, it was actually absolutely valid for the global picture, this 1.5 degree reasoning that I had. That right. on the carbon dioxide side, it was 1.7, but then with methane reduction. And linking into PECA, you know, uh, uh, the food sector will be 80% of emissions after 2050. So reducing emissions from the food sector is critical. And uh, rice cultivation and cattle uh, is uh, the biggest source of emissions, actually. So artificial meat is also one solution. So maybe you can bring fish farming further to artificial fish. I don't know, question mark. Uh, yeah, so a few thank comments you, from my side. Yes. And, okay. and thank you for dialing in. No, it's getting late there. So, <laughs> Maria. Well, follow factors, that's for one. Um, and for the other, uh, I think there's been a lot of focus on misinformation coming from, from Russia. There are actually quite a lot of, like, even just the code I was uh, searching for, for this, it was attributed to five different uh, leaders, world wealth leaders, and none of, none of it was true. So it, it is actually much closer than, than you think. Thank you. Martin? So I'm always delighted to be at these events because the Nordic Museum somehow captures a Nordic spirit that's better than we have in, in the Nordics. <laughs> and, and, and when we... When we think about what will make the world better, I think we should take that spirit and distill it to what you have here. Like people who believe in the rule of law, uh, people who believe in honesty and transparency, people who respect every other human being, irrespective of origin, and people with a lot of curiosity about science and technology. And there's something very potent there that is much broader than Nordic. Anybody can be part of it. But, but I find that, that the Nordic Museum somehow is capturing that very unique spirit. And, and that gives hope for any problem we need to solve. Thank you. Okay. Pekka? Yeah, I want to summarize the Nordic philosophy with a few sentences. We all have to work for true circular economy and sustainability. We cannot forget it. That's point number one. And point, num point number two, which is as important, make love, not war. Thank you. Spasibo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jaron. Thanks, Martin. Be well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so home stretch, we have one real treat of a panel left for you. Washington State, along with several of the Nordic countries, have become hotbeds of innovation for emission-free aviation. And uh, we have a, a real who's who of that industry that's going to speak now. And uh, to present, we have another one of our, our COVID sufferers, unfortunately, Lisa Steffler from GeekWire who came down with it the other, the other day and is going to moderate remotely. So take, uh, give them a warm reception. Okay, 
I was thinking about breaking for lunch now, but I don't know. Really up the urgency and pathways for cutting carbon emissions worldwide. And of course, we're focusing on aviation, which is contributing around 3% of overall emissions. Um, and I would like to introduce our panel. We have Nicholas Lund, a director at Rockton, a Swedish company that's moved from leasing aircraft to commercial airlines and is now investing in clean aviation. It's raising a sustainable aviation fund that could total 200 million euros, or about $210 million. We also have with us Chris Cooper, who is the vice president of North America for Nesta, a company launched many decades ago as Finland's petroleum producer, but started exploring biofuels in the 1990s and is now the world's largest producer of sustainable aviation fuels. We have with us Sami Ladencio, I'm sure he'll correct me later, um, the no. Vice President for Government and Institutional Relations at Finnair. The airline has the goal of cutting its net emissions in half by 2025 compared to 2019 levels and by reaching net zero by 2045. And we have Heitha, here we go, Dokstish. She is the Deputy Chief Operating Officer at Iceland Air. The airline has a near-term goal of cutting its operational emissions in half by 2030 compared to 2019 levels and reaching net zero by 2050. Uh, again, welcome to all of my panel and thank you so much for traveling here today. Um, and I'd like to just jump in. I know we're running a little bit late. So I was hoping to start with the technologies that you are, we're going to be using to get us to net zero emissions and Chris, with Nesta as being in the space the longest, perhaps you can kick us off by telling us about the approach that your company is taking. Yes, Lisa Kitos. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Hopefully we'll have a, a lively session that will provide you information about you know, how you all arrived here for the event and maybe how you're going home. But air travel is critical to all of us. However, we represent a minority. The minority of us are able to extend this uh, wonderful luxury in our lives of air travel, to be able to get to know the world and get to know wonderful places and do business worldwide. But this industry represents a, a greenhouse gas emissions of about two to three percent. That doesn't sound like a lot, except there's only a few of us that are using this uh, method of transportation. And so Neste had taken advantage of an opportunity many, many years ago, and 15 years ago it converted conventional assets. Those assets were refineries that were using fossil fuel to produce the energy that we use for air travel. Air travel requires a special liquid fuel to burn in turbine engines. The neat opportunity is that they stuck with it. They worked to develop policy. They worked to develop the environment that, that allowed SAF or sustainable aviation fuel to be accepted worldwide. Today, this product is accepted. It's distributed by Neste through conventional means. So we're using large cargo vessels as we distribute the product into airports as close as San Francisco International Airport, Los Angeles, uh, Helsinki, Amsterdam, Munich, Frankfurt. Uh, these are airports worldwide that are giving airlines the ability to engage SAF and provide the solution that their customers need. SAF, in its neat form, reduces greenhouse gas emissions on its life cycle by 80%. This product gives us the ability to continue expanding the use of air travel. This is an industry that intends to double in the next decade. This is an industry that needs to find solutions. We found great solutions in the road transportation. We can put batteries in cars now. We can put batteries into heavy road transportation, but we don't have the extension cords long enough to fly an aircraft uh, back and forth through the Nordics uh, to an event as, as great as this. So we'll have to use what's available today. Our products made from uh, only uh, wastes and residues, so used cooking oils, animal fats, and we're able to produce that in a refinery. So a former refinery we, was, we were able to convert that was able to bring this product to market. 
Now Neste represents 80% of the world's production. We made recent investments in the United States around the feedstock, but you may be aware that we've invested in a refinery in the San Francisco Bay Area, where a local refinery here to this market, Marathon Petroleum, we now have a joint venture. That will allow us to continue our expansion of renewable diesel and eventually a sustainable aviation fuel. But assets exist in these markets today. Neste in Finland uh, made the conversion of its Porvo refinery, but the uh, Cherry Hill or the uh, Anacortes refineries locally can find their way to this conversion and the feedstocks are available uh, and, and we can find our way to a, a greener future in aviation. That's great. Thanks, thanks so much, Chris. I want to give Nicholas a chance to speak to this as well. Um, you're looking at emerging next generation solutions. I'm wondering, have you made any investments yet? And what technologies are you excited about? No, we haven't made it. Well, we made an investment in another leg we have, which is climate change mitigation, uh, where we invested in, in an aerial firefighter. But in the new technology sector, we're looking uh, at most companies, I would say. Um, and um, what you're looking for there is you know, the electrification. So you'll have you know, the um, full electric, which is fully battery powered with electrical motors. Uh, or you then have the hybrid electric, where you combine the batteries with another power source, which could be a conventional jet turbine and or uh, hydrogen combined with a fuel cell. Um, I mean, for our purpose, we, we're most interested in the hybrid electric solution because it gives you more payload and range. I mean, the, the reality is today that the energy density of batteries are not really where you need it to be. Um, you can you know, fly very few, a sh small payload, a short range, uh, but that's really not what's needed. So you have to scale it up somewhat, uh, but we'll see this develop over time. You know, we're fairly optimistic about the energy density. It will develop, um, we will get, you know, end of this decade will definitely be two or three times uh, better than today which will you know, make it more reasonable to have maybe 50 seat aircraft uh, that can you know, go like 600 kilometers, something like that. So that's, that, that's also, and the, the other part of it is also that uh, the benefit is that the operating, direct operating cost is falling fairly dramatically if you go that way for two reasons, no fuel in whatever form it is, uh, and also the maintenance of these aircraft is gonna be much lower because Conventional jet turbine engines are fairly complicated and needs a lot of uh, maintenance while you know it operates at over 800 degrees a Electrical motor. It's got one moving part Operates about to 1820 uh, degrees. So it's lasts forever uh, So that's actually a good driver. You know once you have that you will have airlines Running for it because they obviously uh, want to drive down their operating direct cost That's great. So Sami and Haitha You've heard the pitches for some sustainable aviation fuels for um, electric and uh, fuel cell hybrid. What are your airlines doing? Where, how are you making some inroads into the sustainable space? Um, maybe start with, with maybe, Haitha? Yeah, maybe or I can. Sam, yeah. sure. Thank you, Lisa. Also, can you hear me? Thank you for having me. I'm Fine here in, in the discussion. First, I think I have to make a reference to what Pekka was speaking in the previous panel. There was a lot of references to nerds and, and Finnish nerds as a kind of <laughs> introvert guys. And just for future reference, uh, you know there's a way to make a distinction between introvert and extrovert Finns. I mean, so when you're having a discussion with an introvert Finn, he's looking at his feet. But when you're having a discussion with an extrovert Finn, he's looking at your feet. So keep that in mind, so that's the way. No, I mean, it's, it's uh, thanks, thanks for Chris and Nicholas for, for those opening, opening remarks. and. Uh, in that sense, I think that we are right away jumping to the core of the issue because when we are looking at the emission reduction in aviation, let's say by 2050, when we are out 2045 when FINA is aiming to be at zero, the core of the discussion really is on, on sustainable aviation fuels. I mean, there are other measures and ways that we can also go towards the emission reduction, but SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, whether it's biofuels or whether it's kind of electrified synthetic fuels, that really is the key. But the challenge there is, is the, well, it's, it's twofold. It's the availability of SAF and it's, it's price. And, and this is the airlines talking. I think that, that, that Heida will agree with me on this. I was just recently in Brussels and uh, we had a meeting and, and, and a public meeting 
Pepe, also the CEO of Lufthansa Group, Karsten Spohr was participating and he, he just said that they had just calculated that if they, Lufthansa Group, which is the biggest airline in Europe, if they had all the stuff in the world available right now, it would last for three days and then it will be all finished. So it's, it's a matter, it's a challenge really for all of us is so how to scale up the production and availability of, of staff, which is also a, a political question as well. And it's a question of capital. I'm sure we will, will come, come uh, back to that as well. And when it comes to price, uh, we have a good collaboration with Neste and, and some other producers as well. Here we can uh, face one challenge, which is that, that, the that the aviation is a global business. So if you look at the SAF policies, for example, between the United States and the EU, the policies are totally different. So when we are operating in the EU area, the SAF than the, than the traditional kerosene jet fuel, basically. But when you go to California, where you have a lot of tax credits and different kind of incentives in place, which is not the case in, in, in the EU, the SAF price expensive than traditional jet fuel. So there's a huge difference in the regions in the world that we have to be able to overcome and find ways to create joint policies that treat all the airlines in the same way. Yes, thank you. Um, I have to begin with, um, it's, it's important that aviation has united on a common goal. 2050. So aviation is going for net zero by 2050. And this is important because it creates a level playing field. We're all headed in the same direction. Um, and it's also of note to uh, mention the different pathways that aviation has in order to achieve uh, a reduction. So you have new technology. And what does new technology mean for aviation? Basically, it's realized through fleet renewals. And fleet, fleet renewal is something that is a very strategic decision for an airline, probably the, the biggest decision an, air, an airline makes. Secondly, you have uh, operational efficiencies. Uh, and this is something that is in the DNA of airlines. We're always looking for means to reduce our uh, fuel burn, our emissions. And then thirdly, SAFs, or sustainable aviation fuels, and uh, as a last factor, offsetting. But here today, maybe focusing mostly on, on technology and what we can do today and what is maybe further into the future. And uh, looking at these four measures that I've just described, uh, the two that will have the biggest impact are new technology and SAF. And they are also probably the furthest. You can always go further into operational efficiencies, but the, the big wins will come through these two uh, pathways. Uh, and as an example, the, uh, the net zero by 2050 goal is carried by, by SAF by two thirds of the goal. So it's a very important uh, measure to achieve. Um, also looking into the, the sort of different applications in aviation, it's tempting to look at uh, the different um, flying distances. Especially looking at the energy transition, the, the, the challenge will, build, will be to develop range. And if we look into new technology, um, Domestic aviation has the potential to be decarbonized. We are designing an electric, fully electric aircraft, a 19-seater, that could refer to the lower operating cost. Happening with a, a, a U.S.-based company, uh, hydrogen fuel cells that. Uh, decarbonize uh, domestic aviation. But if we look at, to look at the, the longer range uh, aircraft, um, the cross Atlantic uh, flying, then we have to rely on SAF. Um, so I agree with your point on 
uh, we need to, to build the, the demand and increase the supply in order to meet these goals. Because energy transition in, in, in terms of this kind of flights is further away, 15, 20 years at least, I would say. some of these technologies are, are scaling up and becoming increasingly available. And I want to transition into asking a little bit about the sort of carrots and sticks that will help us get there faster. Um, you know, there's so many different players involved in pushing this along, whether it's government regulations, industrial alliances and goals, venture capital, tax breaks. Holders are asking for um, I'd like to hear how those factors are helping and hurting progress. Um, maybe, well, we can start with the airlines again or, or, go, or go to um, Chris or, or Nicholas. Yeah, I can go. Um, sure. <clears throat> no, I mean, there, there, and a lot of capital is needed. Uh, there's no doubt about that to develop. So, I mean, there, from our point of view, but it's also to come up with additional or new technologies for producing stuff that drives down the cost. Because as you heard, two thirds uh, for long haul is gonna be stuff, but at the price range it is today, somebody has to pay that, you know, and I don't think any of us wants to pay, you know, twice plus for the tickets uh, if we can avoid it. So uh, hopefully, you know, we're gonna see new technologies, uh, maybe on the power to liquid side where you uh, can maybe produce green hydrogen cheaper and do the process that actually take green hydrogen to its synthetic, synthetic fuel. So uh, definitely capital. In the EU, we definitely see that uh, in the EU taxonomy and the EU Green Deal, there's definitely intention to skew the market towards sustainability. I mean, there's gonna, there's, at least if you talk to EU, there's definitely gonna be a fuel tax, carbon emissions gonna cost, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I, mean, I think we're probably going to see carrots also, like for, for sustainable aircraft, going to get uh, lower parking fees, lower navigation charges, and so forth. So I can't speak for, the, for what if, what's happening in, in the US, but uh, Europe is definitely skewing the market towards anything sustainable. There's going to be ratios of how much um, stuff you have to drop in at airports and so forth. So, so capital, uh, and you know, I, honestly, I think that the aviation industry itself has to provide a lot of that capital because this is a longer play. It's not the traditional digital world when you invest and you know, maybe you can get an exit in four years. And to develop an aircraft takes long time, it takes very long time. Uh, and I think a lot of these new technologies uh, need to be tested and all that. So uh, there is capital needed. And in Europe, there's some capital provided, uh, but I think the industry, together with the financial traditional venture capital and so forth, needs also to come in because we, we at least see that there is a great opportunity uh, in the exit side because if you have a aircraft platform which works for example uh, the existing OEMs who are you know in my opinion maybe not doing too much uh, they will have to buy it because otherwise you no know, they will not survive long term so and it takes you know they, they can't you can't just uh, reverse engineer it that takes too long time yeah. So, Lisa, you know, to answer your question a little bit uh, further, you know, I've kind of explained to the audience, if SAF is a available solution, it drops into conventional resources, so there is no additional capital required for its deployment. There's conversion opportunities at refining level, uh, tank level could be converted as we did in uh, California from a conventional uh, fossil fuel tank that was polluting the environment, emitting greenhouse gases, to the introduction of SAF. When we use the question of the audience of how many of you want to be able to fly worldwide and be able to reduce your emissions while doing it, I would assume that you would all agree. So we have two candidates on the, uh, on the panel today that, that need to hear from you. And they need to know that you're cooperating with them and helping them. The idea of carrots and sticks, I, I would tell you, not in this equation, all of the solutions are going to be required, but what we misinterpret is the stick. And what we're referring to is to move a beast of burden, you can either offer them a carrot or you can whack them with a stick. We may assume by definition that the stick in this case is a mandate, but what does a mandate really propose an environment that the minority of our populations use? What it provides is the opportunity for investment. 
assurances for capital to move into this space. And the fastest way to reduce the cost of sustainable aviation fuel will be to allow mandates to drive the expansion of production, provide the incentive that those who have the technology or will one day develop the technology have an incentive, have a reason why they can participate with the airlines. This isn't an all or, or none, or it's not an us against them. It's all of us together. We have a brilliant uh, program with Finnair and in which we actually provide their customers the ability to purchase SAF. Neste, their number one customer, purchases our SAF and delivers it to them for their operation. An exciting opportunity that we were able to expand and then bring in BCG and other consulting groups who do a massive amount of air travel within this region. They were able to purchase the staff, and together with Finnair, we were able to put SAF on their aircraft at zero cost to Finnair, but directly reducing their emission reductions as a result of their operations. So there's a, a synergy if we all work together. But when we call it us against them or carrots and sticks, Lisa, we're missing the opportunity that SAF is available today, and we can all participate in it. Maybe if I, if I can take it from there, already Nate to just respond briefly, and I, in a way, your, your core analysis, of course, I agree with, basically, as you know. But as I said, I mean, this is also a question of policies. It's a question of regulation. It's, it's a global question. So we have different kind of regulatory processes taking place in different parts of the world, which is once again coming back to the, to the issue of price of sustainable aviation fuel. So as I said, in Europe, we have to pay three or four times more, uh, three or four times the price of, of kerosene. In the US, it's, it's much lower and the availability is low. Then we have, it's a, it's a global competition. Some of the biggest airlines in the world are operating from the Middle East, you know, from Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha, you name it, basically. And they might have different forms of subsidies in, in, in their operations as well. And then we have China, and then we have other Asian countries et cetera, that have different systems. So as an airline, in order to retain your competitiveness, in order to retain the connectivity of your country, of your region with the rest of the world, you just have to tackle and find a balance with the question of price. So when the, when the price of SAF is three or four times more than the jet fuel, having a blending man mandate, which is kind of forcing the airlines to you know, tank, tank this, this up to a certain extent uh, for your flights at the moment. That's not the solution. We have to be more smart and that, more strategic and look at the global picture. I agree. Hey, are, you, are you jumping in there? Yeah. Um, uh, good point, Sami. Um, I want to also stress that when we're looking at this issue, um, the, 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 we also always have to address it in a global manner. Um, the sol solutions that we're presenting, they have to be safe, they have to be sustainable, but they also have to be economically viable or commercially sustainable, if you would. So looking at the, the full system is always going to be a, a driving factor. I believe that um, innovation will be the key to this, and we heard yesterday uh, the Icelandic minister, Lilja Alfredsdóttir, referred to uh, incentivizing innovation and I think that is also th something that has to happen in, in this field. We need um, to break, break some technological barriers in order to upscale faster and for instance in the case of SAF moving um, to power to liquid where we have the potential of reaching a 100% of the um, uh, ratio between uh, captured CO2 and, and emitted. So um, and that also brings me to um, <clears throat> because we've been talk talking about the Nordics and, and, and Iceland, and uh, what we are also looking for is um, uh, some of the, um, the uniqueness uh, of the geographical position that Iceland could bring and the renewable energy sources. So, for instance, for Iceland, looking at this, um, this development globally, uh, the possibility of being a producer of SAF e-fuels in the future is a, a very exciting option as well. And looking at the, the scale of things, uh, a relatively small pilot could, for instance, really move the needle looking at uh, Icelandic aviation. So um, I think that taking, the, taking a look at um, strategic locations and, and taking the sort of shortest path to new technology will also be a key factor moving forward.
It's wonderful. Thank you. I, I want to insert a little bit of Seattle flavor into this since the event is being held in my fair city. Um, in looking at some of the local companies here and their role in this space as well, um, looking at Amazon has made sustainable aviation fuel purchases. They're in the process of buying their own planes for deliveries. Uh, Microsoft has been investing in some, um, some venture capital into some staff ventures. They're also paying for the sustainable aviation fuels for flights between Seattle and San Francisco. Boeing is building more efficient planes. I know Iceland Air is a customer. Um, do you have any thoughts on the roles that some of these companies are playing in kind of moving the needle towards more sustainability? And I don't, anyone who wants to jump in there since it's a little bit of a, a wild ball. I, I, uh, I can try question. briefly. Uh, again, they're all customers of Neste uh, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, Neste was the first and only uh, to sign the, the Amazon or what we attribute as their climate pledge. And what we were able to do with them is continue to grow through uh, telling our story and, and working throughout the markets. And they've encouraged other airlines to join. But Amazon is, a, is currently, through their aircraft and those third party aircraft they use, a large consumer of SAF and customer of Neste. We're going to continue to expand that globally uh, as we work with Amazon. But what we find is that the partners that are working with the airlines, as imagine, the Microsofts, the Googles, they are putting passengers on board these aircraft. And they've been participating. And so they participate with the airline. And so together with Neste, our airline partners are able to help facilitate the delivery of SAF to the consumer who wants to purchase it. So whether it's uh, on par with conventional jet fuel pricing or two to two times more expensive, their consumers in this case, the Seattle market are buying product that's not specifically in the market today, uh, but it is within reasonable proximity. What we're very excited about is that the state is working diligently on developing and the finishing of its low carbon fuel standard. That will go a long way to accompany the federal standards that are available today. What we need to remember is that SAF is, is a new technology. Uh, socialism is a terrible word in the United States, certainly in this area. However, we need to realize that for 100 years, we've been subsidizing fossil fuel companies to distribute their products. We've given them tax incentives, development, and technological advances in R&D. That's called socialism. What I'm hoping we learn from this is that there's an opportunity in Seattle to expedite the learning of what's been done in California, realizing that renewable road transportation in California is, is basically paying for our ability to participate in the aviation space. We need the Washington, Washington to address it in a manner that provides us with equality across these products. Gives the airlines the ability to participate with us who will be our primary and almost exclusive source of distribution. And so the airlines can participate with the state, its legislature, and then the community begins to be able to participate in this and purchase SAF as it's available. But I would tell you, thumbs up for the community uh, the, the corporate space has done a very good job from Starbucks to Amazon to uh, Google. They, again, all of them have done terrific. So, yeah, hands up, ha applaud them, please, because they've done a great job. Maybe just one, one small comment. I mean, because those, many of those companies are dealing with the behavior of people. I don't know, they might have the ability to have some sort of technical solutions as well. But when it comes to kind of directing the people of, of uh, the, the, the behavior of people and customers. I think they have a big role there. And also as, as an example of that, for example, Google now when you're going there and trying to fight ticket prices, airline ticket prices from one place to another, and you have a lot of these you know, online tra travel agents when, you, when all of us, we have done those comparisons. And now that you're using Google, they can actually give you the order in the, in the, in the order of, of the emissions that those airlines are uh, doing during those flights. So I think it's a very important thing actually that the, when the customer does that comparison, this is actually coming up first uh, that you can see, okay, this is, this is the route I'm going to take, this is the airline I'm going to take, and this is the effect of that. So this kind of a very simple uh, behavior related matters are also very important. Yeah, I also believe that uh, this, is, this will always be a, a combination, a cumulation of, of all means available to us. And, and um, so the message that we are receiving from our passengers always, of course, matters uh, dearly to us. 
Um, we are, of course, um, moving forward in, in, um, on the sustainability journey, and I believe that what aviation really needs now is a, a green revolution of technology. And what's interesting, if you, we've talked about history here today, um, and looking back, learning from history, leaning into the future, and if we look at past revolutions, they have all been um, driven by huge technological advancements. Um, doing things better, faster, more efficiently at scale. Um, regarding the future of aviation, sustainable aviation, we're sort of at the brink. We're not quite there yet. And we need the, the push to get there. The push will come from many different directions. It will come from passengers, it will come from um, different companies, and it will come from government policy. And I believe now that uh, it is very important that the government plays this role by incentivizing the, the research, the development, in order to get us past this brink and, and really take off into the future. Wonderful. Um, I know that we are running a little late on time, um, and so I want to maybe just look ahead with some optimism, I hope. I mean, we've, we've clearly heard that there are a lot of challenges in this space, but reasons to be hopeful. Maybe if each one of you could share one thing, you know, when you wake up at two in the morning, anxious about what's happening with our planet, that reassures you somewhat in the aviation space that there is, there is you know, positive, aggressive movement taking place. Is there kind of one thing each of you could kind of point to that, that is reassuring to you? Um, I mean, I think in general, I mean, I sometimes have to rhyme, remind myself that um, the time from the Wilbur brought, uh, from the uh, Wright brothers' first flight until we had supersonic flights was 44 years. Um, so that tells us that it can be done, basically. We've got to move faster than that, though. <laughs> yeah, right? but I mean, you know, the, the, the starting point when the right person, there were no industry, right? Today we have a big industry, there's a lot of uh, stakeholders in it, um, so it will, shouldn't take 44 years. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some optimism on, on let's say, with, you know, the, the environmental or sustainability aspect of aviation is very much focused on the greenhouse gas emissions. There's another part, uh, you know, because the emissions at high altitude creates other problems. And for example, on contrails, which you know, by the academics and science world is assumed or calculated to be, has a, as much of a climate impact as all the emissions from the aviation. Um, that is something now which is worked on and we're looking at it and, and uh, hope to engage in it that uh, you can now with new uh, satellite, uh, real-time satellite uh, images, reroute so, uh, in, and by just, the, 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 it's been you know, a big study on this now, so by, you would reroute and that would be about 1% more fuel cost, but then you will basically be able to cut that uh, with about 80%. So that, that's, that's an enormous impact, it's just that contrails hasn't been a issue that has come up, but you know, it's just you know, a question of time when that suddenly gets the attention again. So that's something that can go fairly cheaply, quickly, and will have an enormous impact in terms of, of uh, sustainability for aviation. That's great. At first, I was a little worried you were taking us into a dark place, but um, <laughs> that, that piece has a solution, potentially, is really exciting. All right, uh, others want to jump in? Uh, sure, I'll finish. Uh, you know, it, what's really exciting is, again, knowing Neste's, uh, you know, our purpose, and that is to make a healthier planet for our children. What we're finding is that uh, the going it alone is quickly finding pace with, with our peers. Uh, we donated um, a Kaisa Heikinen joining one of the largest or the world's largest oil company on their board and quickly we're seeing changes. We're reading about Marathon joining Neste as our joint venture company. Philip 66, Chevron, we're finding others realizing that they're not making decisions as specific and only for shareholder return but consumer drive. They realize there is no shareholder return if they do not begin to think of the future. The future is tremendously bright. We have a lot of great technologies that will come. 
McKinsey released recently a report that describes these technologies. And although they incrementally uh, are more expensive as we expand even to the extent of power to liquids, which is probably 10 to 15 times the cost of, of SAF, what we realize is there is momentum. And as we all work together and we work with the airlines, we work the technology providers, the solutions are available. As we think more together rather than independently, we can change the minds of those that are in authority to, to help us. We don't know the effect immediately as to the ecology and how the planet will change in the short term. We assume it will be the same. But if we wait for a future technology, we may miss the opportunity to have a bright future to provide the world that, the, the, that we want for our children. But again, this is an opportunity that we're all doing together. So I'll give you the phone number of your congressman or senator after this so that we can reach them together. And we can explain to them that we need their help and that they can help us with policies that will bring this about even faster. But we can't claim that it's an airline problem. This isn't an airline problem. This is a transportation proposition. We must look at it that way and more holistically find solutions. And they really are everything. The really neat thing is, uh, as, as well as it took us a little while to get to supersonic, we grounded those aircraft and we don't fly inefficient aircraft. We fly more efficient aircraft. We act more efficiently. And by doing that together, we're gonna see a bright future. And I'm very excited to be part of that with Neste. Yeah, maybe, maybe just to say, I have great points by, by Christian and Niklas. And, uh, I'm um, just to say that I'm, I'm also very optimistic. I mean, all the greatest changes in the, in the history of humankind have always been taking place when, when we have to make changes. And there's a lot of things, as we have heard, I mean, a lot of things are, you know, bubbling under at the moment and happening. There's a, but, 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 I mean, we just have to make choices and we have to find ways to collaborate, uh, you know, in a more efficient, efficient way. And I fully believe that that is going to happen because we have to. There's no choice. We have to be carbon neutral. And, and, and that is the way we are going to. And then maybe another small concrete thing uh, about being optimistic and uh, positive is that, you know, when it comes to aviation and, and, and flying, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about the duration and, and the, 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 the duration of, of your flight when you're flying from one point to another point. And then it comes back to issues such as route planning. And just as a positive note, so if you're planning to fly to Helsinki from Seattle, there will be a new route opening from, from Seattle as of 1st of June to Helsinki, which will be, I guess, the shortest route between Seattle and Helsinki and the rest of the Nordics. So welcome on board, in addition to, to, to Iceland Air's excellent that's, offering. That's, that's with a Boeing aircraft, too. So that's very exciting. Yeah, maybe lastly, just chipping in, um, what really gets me excited about uh, sustainability is the technological advancement, the, the innovation that we're going to see. Um, Okay, we've talked about the net zero by 2050, but, but then what, you know? What about true zero? What about truly decarbonizing aviation? And I'm really excited by the projects I mentioned earlier, uh, decarbonizing the domestic sector, um, because I believe in the learnings that you can derive from getting to new technology, testing it out, seeing how it works with infrastructure, all the operational landscape. And I truly believe that there is technology that we have yet to discover that will accelerate us on this path even further. That's wonderful. Thank you so much to all of you for it's, it's coming to our city. It's good to be in a panel that is competing with lungs, but it's okay, you know. <laughs> and thank you for following my giant head. I really appreciate being able to participate remotely. It's just been a pleasure and an honor. And, and thank you all so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, thank you, Lisa and, and panelists. And uh, this uh, presentation and discussion, like the whole morning, leaves me optimistic that even though we have problems, we also have solutions. And the morning also leaves me hungry. And I have good news and good news. We get to have lunch. And of course, um, uh, you know, I'm hoping it's fish, but it is definitely sponsored by the Icelandic uh, Americans Chamber of Commerce. And the other good news is that we get to come back. And uh, because we have so many exciting topics and we've run a little longer, I'm asking people to come back at one o'clock sharp. So let's go network, have some lunch and meet back here at once. Thank you. Thank you.